Good afternoon and welcome to the Transportation Committee meeting of Wednesday, March 26, 2014. Uh, I am joined by my colleagues Paul Koretz and Tom LaBonge and Paul Krikorian. Uh, my understanding is Mr. Parks will be with us shortly. Uh, it's a regular meeting of the Transportation Committee meeting and this is the beginning of the meeting so that means it's time for multimodal roll call. Uh, give me by a show of hands who has taken uh, a bus in the past two weeks. Uh, who has taken a, uh, a rail in the past two weeks? Uh, who has walked further than their car in the past two weeks? <laughs> All right, very cool. Who's been to Travel Town in the last two weeks? <laughs> All, right. All right, very good. Okay. Uh, thanks, Mr. LeBron. You always said like brothers, man. Like brothers, believe me. Uh, if uh, nobody objects, I'm going to recommend uh, for the regular committee agenda uh, that we move items uh, five and six on consent. I don't see speaker cards on either of those. No objection. I move. All right, we will move items five and six on consent. And that brings us to our, uh, the rest of the agenda. And uh, Mr. Chair, I have a concurrent county meeting, so I'm going to just excuse myself at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy. As you would say, Mr. LeBon should serve the people well. Um, that brings us to item number one on the regular agenda, which is a communication from the mayor relative to the appointment of Mr. Bain to the Board of Transportation Commissioners for a term ending June 30th, 2017, to fill the vacancy created by the resignation of Mr. Kang. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you for your willingness to serve. Of course. Uh, colleagues, this is an appointment I am I'm very excited about. We spoke briefly before the meeting, and I think that uh, this gentleman's background is uh, exceptional for, for the Transportation uh, Commission. Uh, in, in, in fact, Mr. LeBonge left. I'm willing to have you move and, and sit up here if you'd like and join the committee. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't do that, no. <laughs> uh, for, for the benefit of the rest of the committee, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what your background is and why you feel that you're qualified to serve on this commission? Um, so again, my name is Tafari Bain. I was I'm born I was born and raised in Los Angeles. I grew up in South Los Angeles. Um, I recently wrapped up a six-year tenure at Trust South LA, a community or a nonprofit organization that focuses on affordable housing development, um, urban planning with community residents, and looking at the development of recreational space. Um, I was working there for six years as a fo focus on mobility and recreational programming, um, where I built a lot of experience um, working with community residents to help build ownership over the changes that they saw in their community and helping folks community plan to identify the kind of changes they want to see, um, building vision with residents, working with city partners, and working with private partners in order to make those visions happen. So I'm really excited about the changes that I see in Los Angeles and the opportunity to make sure that those changes benefit residents, um, business owners, multiple stakeholders. I mean, it's a great opportunity. And I also serve on the board director with Ciclavia. I've been on the board of director of Ciclavia for the last three years, um, helping spearhead the conversations around communities like South Los Angeles, Southeast Los Angeles, um, um, ensuring that this amazing community partner, this project that helps to activate LA city space um, and bring new resources to communities um, gets expanded and get, becomes an institutional part of our city's culture. And I understand uh, you have some volunteer activities as well that are related to uh, transportation? Um, I have a lot of volunteer activities. Which, uh, which one do you recommend? Uh, Ciclavia. Oh, yeah, Ciclavia. So my, my time with Ciclavia has been really exciting. Um, obviously, it's been a conversation, you know, it, it's grown and grown from you know, 50, 75,000 to over 150,000 residents. We managed to get it to, out to Venice, this 15-mile route, um, and now we're looking at um, new routes in South Los Angeles and Southeast Los Angeles, and those conversations, you know, I, I feel very, really important and really exciting for the city. In, uh, in your experience with uh, Trust South LA, uh, you, you've done a lot of work on community planning and, and you've done a lot of work uh, uh, dealing with neighborhood issues. As, as, as a council, as we start building out the, the bicycle master plan in the city of Los Angeles, a lot of us will face challenges and conflicts with, with some of our constituencies in various places. I know uh, Mr. Bruins here in the audience is eager for me to move forward on a bike lane on Barrington. I saw that Facebook comment this morning. Uh, I, saw, I saw that too. And uh, uh, 
how do you, how from your experience do you, do you advise us to help navigate some of those challenges with uh, stakeholders who may not be interested in seeing a bike lane or a bike path uh, in their neighborhood? Well, I think that one way to approach the conversation um, is to think about and help to um, help folks vision around where Los Angeles wants to go as a whole. I think when we focus on the big picture of, of our city and a lot of the benefit we all want to see, a lot of folks want to see communities where people can walk, people can engage in their local community space. People want to see a more efficient network of streets, of, 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 of travel opportunities. Um, and I think that when we talk about how we sort of move towards that, that vision together, first build a vision with everybody, and as we move towards that vision, it has to be a hand-in-hand -hand process, both working with stakeholders on the date on a minutia and the details of these conversations. I think folks sometimes get scared by the idea of change, and sometimes the going through the conversation and giving folks clear response to their concerns helps us move through planning processes where we think that there are barriers, but there aren't as many barriers as we as, as we like to imagine. Um, so I do think really conscious engagement and planning with folks. I also think being mindful about all of the impacts that we're creating with our projects and ensuring that those impacts are balanced um, and, and both increasing the activity and access to these communities and these spaces and travel opportunities at the same time as being mindful of working folks through a process, not taking things too fast. Um, you know, being mindful about working with people to vision together to then make a process together that works. And uh, one last question. How did you get here today? I took the bus and then I walked a long way. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, colleagues, questions? All right, so we will move that forward uh, to council uh, with a positive recommendation. I Thank you for your willingness to serve. I look forward to working with you guys. You bet. Thank you. Mr. Clerk, are we uh, close enough to the witching hour to uh, do the special? Uh, One minute. Okay. Uh, I will then take a general public comment right now, yes. uh, and that will be uh, Antonia Ramirez. And before you sit down, I just want to acknowledge that Mr. Parks has joined us. Thank you very much. On the appointment of Mr. Tafari Bain to the Board of Transportation Commissioners for the term ending June 30th, 2017, it is my hope that he will have the temerity to address the health, welfare, and safety problems on the LA City transportation, which would include overcrowding, a drug dealing, verbal and physical brawls, gang stalking on, on the buses and our rails by criminal illegal felons and Latino gangbangers, which they provoke most of the crimes that lead to theft and assault, unsanitary and filthy conditions on all forms of transportation, which include MRSA, bed bugs, scabies, which are highly contagious, and urine, feces, graffiti, and carved etchings on the seat upholstery, windows, and handle straps that are above you. And not to mention the nauseating stench. So Lysol, all of these forms of transportation. Number two, in addressing your criminal illegal hiring practices, your illegal aliens and gangbangers and bus drivers and staff, most don't speak English. Number three, what were the reasons that Mr. Brian Kang resigned? And if you can resolve those formal problems, you won't compound them on the confirmation of Mr. Tafari Bain. And thank you. Um, this to me is a matter of principle, and I hope that you will make the bus rides much more and transportation rides safe, effective, and comfortable for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Ramirez. You had a, a card for that item, for item number one. You also had a general public comment card. Yes, and for number two and four. Yes. Yeah, uh, we'll do number two and four in a right. few minutes, but if you'd like to make your general public comment Absolutely. now. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. One moment, please. Uh, one, one moment. <laughs> Sorry. Um, thank you. It is outstanding that Los Angeles is finally going airborne with air transportation and approving the lease with Air Center Aviation Incorporated for aircraft storage and maintenance facility at the Van Nuys Airport. Moreover, I expect the Van Nuys Airport hub to always roll the red carpet out for my stellar dynamic and beloved Gillespie Daredevil pilots extraordinaire of California and all our spectacular, raw, talented LAPD city chopper pilots and sheriff's county chopper pilots and the way they 
whip them puppies. It's amazing. And all our gifted hybrid military aviators who go supersonic, and along with all our pilots who are pulsating with pure, happy, and vibrant energy. So please, Van Nuys Airport, welcome them all, for they are enlightened, sacred able emblem of American patriotism. More importantly, be advised that Van Nuys is a gangland empire, and you have domestic terrorists. They pose mayhem, biological explosion, biochemical, and bomb threats, along with mass destruction, i.e. fires and sabotaging the aircrafts. Be careful. Pilot safety is a priority. And lastly, ladies and gentlemen, as I was flipping last night through this April, American Legion uh, magazine on page 36, I saw the great and honorable Eric Mayor Eric Garcetti. Um, this is a wonderful thing that he is... Um, he is uh, giving tribute to all our military veterans. Again, this is the American Legion magazine, page 36. And here is the Honorable Mayor uh, Eric Garcetti. And the caption reads, it's more than what we say. Again, Honorable um, Eric Garcetti, do. I do thank you for giving tribute to all our military branches and the United States military, for they do protect our military and democratic sovereignty. And let me pass this up, Madam Clerk. I, I would love to pass this around so all of you can uh, look at it, and I would like it back, please. This is wonderful. I, I especially love this magazine. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Mr. Clerk, at, at this time, uh, I recommend that we adjourn the regular meeting temporarily and convene the special meeting. Uh, I'd like to adjourn the regular meeting and convene the special meeting. Yes, sir. All right. So, uh, regular meeting of the Transportation Committee is adjourned temporarily, and we will convene the special meeting. Uh, and uh, I will... Begin on that uh, with item number one. We don't have any speaker cards on that, do we? No, sir. All right. Uh, members, anybody have any discussion on the... Uh, uh yeah, special item one is a resolution of Caretz O'Farrell relative to amending PPD number 13. Right. Mr. Caretz? Yes. Uh, I, we've been working to clarify this issue, and we have uh, a resolution... Uh, copies of which the city clerk has that I believe clarifies this and resolves it as uh, uh, a change that will be taking place on, on only one block in the permit parking district. So I would ask that uh, we accept uh, the substitute of this resolution and uh, ask for an aye vote on it. Any objections? And we'll approve that item. Okay. Uh, before we move forward, um, uh, I'd like to note, I note there's a number of people in the audience here who are here for special item, special agenda item number three. Uh, due to the length of time I think we're going to spend on the parking lot issue and the amount of time I'd like to spend on the bicycle and pedestrian issues but on the balance of the regular agenda, uh, we're going to continue item number three, uh, the uh, uh, Measure R item, until our next meeting. Just so if anybody's here on that, that they'll know in advance. Uh, item number two, Madam Clerk. Or Madam Clerk. Item number two is a CAO report relative to the management and maintenance of parking lots owned by the City of Los Angeles and LADOT contracts with Amco Parking Systems, Modern Parking Incorporated, and SP Plus Municipal Services for terms of five years each and options to extend the contracts for three years for the operation and management of 24 city-owned parking facilities. Uh, before you begin, I'll start with, uh, we have one public comment card on this. Um, you can stay seated. Uh, Mr. Richard, Ro Richard Robbins. Thank you. You're welcome. You know, my name is Richard Robbins. I've appeared here before. I represent Parking Concepts, Inc., we provided each of the members of the committee with supplemental materials yesterday, which included a cover letter from PCI, a supplemental from, letter from myself, and various attachments to the supplemental letter. We also provided the city attorney with a letter setting forth certain positions relating to the RFP. This letter tracks the position in the supplemental letters. I would ask, with the chairman's permission, if I could provide a copy to the clerk at the end of my presentation and have it included in the record. Absolutely. Um, as noted in the various materials, PCI did not protest the implementation of the RFP. Further, the positions set forth in the supplemental letters are not a protest. They're not intended to be a protest. Sorry. 
Rather, due to the passage of time, it's been two and a half years since the proposals were submitted and one and a half years after all the proposals expired by the specific terms of the RFP, consideration is given to awarding contracts per the October 2011 RFP, a two and a half year old RFP. This to us makes little sense. A lot has happened in two and a half years and to ignore it would be frankly a breach of duty by this committee, at least in our opinion. The information used by the proposers goes back to 2009. Does it make any sense to look at information this old? The technology section of the RFP is equally outdated. At best, it is vintage 2011. In the technology world, that's basically a generation ago. The standard should be followed is the one that was used for, by the Department of Airports relating to Ontario. That's uh, explained in more detail in the materials. These contracts, if awarded, would be for five years with a three-year option, which means they were implemented before the mayor took office and they'll end after the mayor leaves office. That makes little sense. Um, recall the city was financially desperate when it adopted this. It was falling off a cliff. Uh, one of the things that needs to be addressed is that all these pass-throughs have not been addressed. No one's ever asked the question, what is this going to cost the city? It's going to cost them a bundle of money and nowhere in the CAO report is that ever addressed. Uh, uh, thank you, sir. I understand. Thank you for your consideration. <clears throat> Thank you very much. All right, and uh, staff, could you please identify yourselves? Ida Rubio with the CAO office. Benet Sanchez with the CAO's office. And where is DOT? I'd like a representative from DOT at the table as well. Hi, D. Allen, DOT. D. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, colleagues, for those who don't remember, this is uh, sort of a, a, a messy issue that has been lingering for a bit. We had this in committee uh, back in August, and, and then in October, it's implementing the direction of, uh, well, you guys know this better than I, implementing the direction of uh, the, the last council to move forward on um, uh, having outside contractors for um, 24 city parking lots. Uh, including Hollywood and Highland. And uh, the issue got delayed when it was last in committee because of some of the concerns about the uh, placement of uh, existing city employees and how they would be handled. Uh, that further got slowed down a little bit because of the uh, convention center uh, worker placement issue, which uh, was bigger and took precedence. So uh, we now have this item here before us today. Uh, I'm wondering if staff, you could just begin to frame the issue a little bit for us so we can ask some questions. Okay. I can try and do that. So um, as you said, we've... Um, the original report got released last year in July of 2013. Um, it was heard in T committee in August, and then we provided a verbal update in September of last year. You asked for a couple of report backs on certain items, and we um, addressed those concerns in our report back that was released in January of 2014, and we're now here today. Um, so in the original report, uh, we recommended that DOT be authorized to enter into three new contracts uh, for a five-year term for the operation and management of 24 city-owned parking lots. As noted in our original report, uh, 16 of those lots are currently operated by GSD and would impact those GSD employees. Um, my last update from uh, GSD personnel was that there was a total of 50 employees that would be impacted. Of the 50 employees, uh, 20 are full-time, 18 are half-time, and 12 are part-time or as-needed employees. Um, one, of your also, one of your concerns also was that you had asked us to meet with the unions. We also met with the unions uh, back in November of 2013. We have not met with them since. Um, at that meeting, we talked about a potential placement process and a timeline in our uh, report that we released, our original timeline was that all the employees would be placed by April, which that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, but th that was the primary things that we discussed at that meeting and that a, a subsequent meeting would need to take place with the union uh, depending upon any decisions that were made. Um, 
Again, the primary reason uh, for GSD wanting to contract out is they are looking for new operators that have demonstrated ability and expertise needed to manage these lots uh, relative to operational efficiencies, new technology through automation and social media, and increased marketing initiatives. The new contract uh, language also contains uh, new provisions such as uh, performance penalties related to operations and the implementation of performance bonds and just overall more accountability for the new operators. In addition, LADOT was seeking an operator who had the financial capacity to front fund the purchase of equipment uh, needed for uh, capital improvements such as the parking automation revenue control equipment. All right, let me ask a couple foundational questions. Um, we're talking 24 lots, uh, some are lots, some are structures, right? Yes, combination. Uh, you said 16 of them are operated uh, by GSD currently. Currently. How are the other eight operated? By uh, private operators currently. Okay. So if it's operated by GSD, um, why is this a DOT matter and why is it in T committee as opposed to ITGS? Uh, GOT, uh, DOT is responsible for the administration of the lots. Okay. They're, they're non-commercial related, so mm -hmm. any lots that generate revenue, DOT is responsible for managing those lots. And they ordinarily bring in GSD employees to do that? Um, I believe there's some history regarding the operation of these lots. At one point, they were all operated by private contractors, and um, I believe in 2004, GSD was, um, or DOT, yeah, GSD was asked to... Um, operate some of the lots and then back in 2011 I believe more GSD was asked to operate more of the lots. Okay. And our record on these lots, some of them uh, uh, bring in some cash and some of them don't do so well, right? Currently? Correct. Right. Uh, and the, the, the rationale behind doing this was to save the city money and focus more on core services and, and get out of managing parking lots, am I correct? Correct, and also to increase the utilization of the right. parking lots, because if you do that, then it brings in more revenue. So we wanted to have the expertise to be able to do that. So explain briefly how this uh, uh, generates revenue or saves money for the city. How is the contract track structured? It saves money in the sense that um, in the proposals, we're actually going to be saving in salary dollars. So. Mm -hmm. Over uh, the course of one year, we could probably save about 600000 in salary, but over the course of five years, that equates to about $3.2 million. And we're also anticipating that they'll bring in more rev that they'll generate more revenue for the parking lots than we get a piece of that? Correct. Uh, there is a, th there's a floor, though. I mean, if, if they operate a lot poorly, there's a floor and we get a certain guaranteed revenue? There is an, there is an assumption that they will... Uh, bring in uh, revenue equivalent to whatever was brought in in 2011-12. Mm -hmm. There is a revenue uh, sharing uh, provision in the contract that they will that the new operators will get 5% if there's an incremental difference in additional revenue brought in from the baseline, which was from 11-12. Okay. I, I think I understood that. I think you're, you're, you're sort of so explaining the, that there's an incentive built in there. There's an incentive built in. So if an operator brings in more revenue than the baseline, which was in 11-12, let's say they bring in an, an additional 500000 from the baseline, they'll get 5% of that 500000 And what if they're absolutely horrible at operating this, the, the, the lot and we make... We, we generate less revenue at that lot than we do currently? Well, there's a provision in the contract that DOT can now... Um, remove operators from the lot, whereas before I believe there wasn't that contract language. So there's more flexibility in adding, uh, adding lots or, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but. Yeah, the, the uh, Rennes Cycles Parking Facilities Division, LADOT, what uh, the contract intends and the agreement intends is to have a flexibility of the department 
to be able to manage and have oversight of the property with regards to revenue maintenance and operation of the parking facilities. Uh, the new contract get, gives us that visibil- uh, flexibility and also uh, control in the way how uh, revenue are generated and how expenses are uh, expended. So let me ask a very basic, sort of dumb question maybe. Uh, what, what exactly is this contract having the awardees do, f- physically do? I mean, they are, they are operating the gates. They are maintaining the lots. They are promoting and advertising. And Tell me specifically what they do. The request for proposal was for 24 city-owned parking facilities to operate, manage, and maintain. Under that concept, what they are, are supposed to do is the, instead of the city doing the actual work of managing, we are subcontracting it to a private. Now, that includes marketing for, for the revenue, uh, not only as far as parking is concerned, but other revenues related to the operation of parking garage. It may include advertising, for, for the walls or, or for the structure. It, would, it could include additional revenue for, let's say, uh, car washing in the garage. These are activities that can be included in the garage. Now, also on the maintenance to make sure that the garage are always in, it's clean, safe, and hazard-free for uh, the pub- public uh, patrons. Okay. We don't know what technology they're going to be using, though, do we? Each, techno- each parking facility needs of technology will be dependent on how they operate, like a parking lot versus a parking garage. So in, in regards to the RP, what we, since the RP itself is just for the maintenance operation and uh, management, the intention of LADOT is to have all our parking facility upgraded using the revenue control system or the revenue equipment. And the only time we will be able to do that is when we do an analysis of the, the facility on what type and what features would we need for the technology. So th- this RFP does not de- uh, uh, dictate or determine whether or not a, a lot is required to have a credit card reader, for instance? Um, Let me, I, th- I think th- what the RFP did was to say that we would use state-of-the-art technology depending on what that technology would be at the time that we let the contract. So it is not as specific to say you should use this versus this, but we wanted to be able to evaluate what was truly the state-of-the-art at the time that we would execute the contract. That's correct. Um, the technology for parking is very uh, fluid right now. It's, it's really moving fast. So the only time that it is um, the specifics, the scope of work of the equipment is when you release a request for bid. I'll give you an example of what we did with Hollywood and Highland. When CERC was about to come in, we need to upgrade our parts equipment because of the change in the operation. And so what we did is we came up with the scope of work, the technology based on the anticipated operation and what will happen. And that was used to be released as a request for bid. Here's where I'm going with this. I have have two concerns about the technology. I want to make sure, and I think you've addressed my first point a little bit anyway, is I want to make sure that we don't award a contract and then uh, three years down the road we have someone who's operating the lots with an antiquated technology when we're trying to be the tech-savvy city. You're, You're saying that that can be dictated. We can dictate to them what technology to use? Well, we're the one actually who will provide the scope. Uh, The parking operator is going, we're using the operator to front fund the money. And as fronting the money, and we pay them and amortize us during the term, what happens is that the parts itself is ours. We're the one who tells them what is important, what is needed based on the technology that is available in the market and at the same time what is good for the 
particular facility. And you are right. We are the one who will be responsible for it. So and here's my ultimate question about the technology. And, and I think it pertains to whether or not we, we negotiated correctly. Is parking lots used to be like the window of a bank teller. Uh, parking lots more and more are like ATM machines. Um, and more and more, it's you, you pay at a kiosk, and then there's someone who's around who gets buzzed if it doesn't work or something like that. And if that's the technology we're, we're, we're moving towards, uh, like most other parking lots in the world, um, one, that implicates how you do the placement of the personnel, but two, might we not have negotiated the contract differently so that the operator makes even less because they don't have as many personnel on duty? The contract has uh, a clause which defines the particular situation that the, op the, the operating contract changes depending on the operation of the lot. And as the lot evolves or the operation of the lot or structure evolves, LADOT is provided that clause to renegotiate the cause of operating the lot. So if we find out two years down the road that they're fully automated and they're only having uh, uh, one person on duty a day instead of three, then we can uh, uh, wind up paying less? That is yeah, correct. correct. Those will be interesting to there's a specific there's a specific item in the draft agreement which is attached to the report which particularly uh, address that particular situation when there is a change in the operation because the change in the operation most of the operation if I may uh, say is mostly labor the big portion of the operators contract is labor and labor changes <coughs> in terms of LWO, since it's under an LWO, under the LWO ordinance, and at the same time, the use of personnel. So as personnel change, and again, my example would be uh, Hollywood and Highland. We used to have uh, almost 40 staff. Now we're down to 20-something, and we reduce our monthly parking because now the cost of operating, which is mainly labor, has been reduced. Let me just uh, go back to the technology. Yes, sir. So the one thing historically the city has, uh, I think, uh, done poorly is we have a tendency to go and develop proprietary kind of technology, and then we're the only one that uses it, and when it gets outdated, uh, we have to start all over again. So is this technology something that can be upgraded? Uh, is it off the shelf? Is it something that doesn't require the entire system to be changed out as things change? It has been a, uh, our policy, together with on-street parking, that it's an off-the-shelf uh, technology type. Uh, no proprietary will be used in any of the, even in, in, in the way how reports are done, where, you know, we do proprietary reports, we will ask the, uh, if there's any change in the report, it would have to be done by the manufacturer rather than us going into the system and applying our knowledge regarding proprietary reports. This, let me get a couple of snapshots. If I read the report accurately, uh, the cost of the city is almost $39 million for the term of the contract and almost $79 million if it's extended. That is correct. That's okay. correct. Okay. Now, what is the revenue that the city expects to get during those two periods? Currently, we're pegged at the baseline revenue of $16.8 million. 16.8. One six point eight, right? Okay, and so the issue is anything over that baseline, we share. They get they five percent, uh, five percent of the excess. Okay, so we haven't projected really what we'll be getting over that baseline. We don't know if with new technology, have we done any calculations? To say with new technology, the changeover, the reduction of personnel, does that baseline? Do we begin to look towards? There are industry standard con uh, council member, um, like uh, for change of parts, the industry standard is between 7 to 15 percent increase in revenue. Um, the additional marketing will all be dependent on the strategies that is set forth, like if you have a new application that you can put your parking facility, uh, that if somebody comes in and looking for, they just use the app. Um, like let's say in Hollywood, uh, they can put the app there and they can find it. So that's more um, 
our projection based on the experience that we have is that for change in park equipment, it would be 7 to 15 percent. And for other revenue related, parking related revenue, it's about 4 percent. Okay, and then um, that baseline stays through the life of the contract and the extension? It's, no, it's only for the first, the five years, five that, years. Uh, five. that's correct. So what do we do if it, we extend? It we would have to, the, the baseline would have to be renegotiated or changed when we do the extension. And that would be based on the fact that we increased our revenue? That is correct, okay. sir. How did we come up with 16.8? The 16.8 is based on the highest revenue yield that our uh, facilities have earned and in FY 11-12. It was the highest rate, and that was 11 12. Yeah, that, that's the highest revenue earned. And then my last question is that we heard through a variety of people that mentioned the RFP expired. And I think we clarified that a while back, that all the decisions made about the RFP were made before it expired. Certainly it's expired by now. But could you clarify what, because it makes it sound like we allowed this to expire and then we kept figuring out who's going to get the contract. Did we fall within our guidelines as to the life of the contract and the selection process? Uh, let me answer that for you, sir. Um, under the RFP process, the RFP ends as soon as it is approved in the selection. So in essence, we released the request for proposal in September of 2011 and uh, the proposals came in in end of mid, I think early December. After that, we do the evaluation process and, mm -hmm. and we sent it to the Board of Transportation Commission after the selection in April 2012. The Board of Transportation Commissioners approved the request for proposal, our selection. By then, that request for proposal, and there is a time for protest. After the protest period, the RFP process technically ended uh, as far as the RFP is concerned. We now go to the next phase, which is the contracting process. Under the ordinance, because of the length of time of the contract and the amount of the contract, it has to go through council and through uh, the for mayor's approval thereafter. And so in essence, RFP is no longer, has been completed and the, the long period of time that it has really been is the more of the contracting process rather than the REP. Then what, what are people referring to when they say it expired? I'm not council sure. Member, I yeah, Council Member, why don't I clarify? The RFP had a specific term, uh, a subsection C of Section 11 of the RFP entitled Rights Reserved for the City, specifically stated that by initiating the RFP, the department reserves the right to adjust deadlines listed in the introduction, section four, schedule of events if applicable. Uh, there was no expiration date on the RFP. In fact, if you look at that section, the city had the right to change those dates if right. necessary to include this period that it would go to council for final approval. As we all know, oftentimes it takes quite a, a bit of time to eventually get a contract together. We've had other RFPs where this has occurred. The important thing, in this particular instance would be to look at whether the city would be required in those 2.5 years since it was first the RFP was issued, whether we'd have to substantially change the scope or the material terms of the RFP. And I believe Mr. Sagles can and Ms. Ellen can answer that, that they've looked at this and no, it doesn't require a change in scope or material terms. So, so the appropriate terminology would be the RFP process concluded at the time that the uh, Transportation Commission approved your recommendation. That's Following the RFP process, I mean the municipal process on the RFP, that's, that is our understanding that the RFP technically have ended when we requested uh, the Board of Transportation Commission to approve our selection and then given the period of the protest that if there's no protest then uh, it then go to the contracting process requesting the mayor and council to approve the contract. That's part two is the contract. The execution. Right, and that was mentioned in subsection 11. That and I would echo that we did uh, with, with Mike, that we did go back to make sure that the scope of work has not changed because then that would cause us to have to go back and relook the process again. 
Thank we, you. We concurred that it had not changed. Mr. Kretz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess a few questions. Uh, so the broader one, we don't feel that uh, the RFP is in any way outdated. We are saying that the scope of work outlined in the RFP is still consistent and it has not significantly changed that we would have to go and defer from the process that we've had already. Uh, is there any chance that the need for this whole process has changed? Because we started looking at this in 2009 when the city was dead broke and, and uh, people were talking about bankruptcy and then we looked at it again not too far beyond that. Um, have we looked at whether the impetus for the whole process is still present? From a fiscal standpoint, um, I think that we're still, um, we're still operating under some fiscal constraints as a whole. Uh, operationally, I would think um, DOT probably still feels that they are looking for new operators. They and, can. And I think add to, to add to that, we, you know, our job is to maintain and operate the parking facilities in the best appropriate way with the best staff. We think that having an operator that can bring in some of the new technology that we need and be able to upgrade them and do it in a timely manner, um, the contractor provides us to do that. And um, because of the fiscal constraints in the city, uh, we have not been able to, to bring that to fore. And so we want to be able to have the flexibility of getting the technology that we all want. So we still need to have it for our operations as we see fit for the facilities. Okay. And I have a couple of questions, and I'll use my district as an example, but I think there's probably a couple others. Um, in the Westwood Village area, uh, it's been an area that at one point decades ago was, was the prime uh, shopping and entertainment district for a while. Um, and it's had a, a very definite decline and it is now just starting to turn around. Um, I think how that parking structure in Westwood is handled will determine whether this once again becomes a viable uh, entertainment uh, and, and shopping area or not. Um, so I'm trying to figure out how much leeway the operator has in dealing with that parking structure and how much uh, the city council and the city have to say about it. Um, as an example, uh, it, it, it is the great parking resource in Westwood and Westwood is very short on parking and Whenever Westwood is doing better, parking becomes the primary problem. So uh, people have been talking about things we can do to use that structure more effectively. Like the bid in Westwood Village is talking about putting in wayfinding signs. Because part of the, uh, what would be stronger utilization um, is the fact that a lot of people know about it, a lot of people don't know about it. Um, once we do that, I believe there'll be more patrons and customers than the structure could handle under current arrangements, which have a certain uh, number of monthly parking uh, arrangements. Now, if we wanted to move those mo monthly parking arrangements out, some of them or all of them, um, knowing that there are other less easily accessible spaces, but there are spaces in other buildings, um, and make those more open to, to uh, daily customer parking. It could turn out that from a purely dollars per parking structure that having more monthly parking was better for the parking structure. But at the same time, it could cause a lot of economic loss in Westwood. It would be a net loss for the city, but it would look better for the parking structure. So the question is, do we have, do we have say-so over those kinds of issues? Um, there also is free parking for the initial visit short term in that structure. And uh, obviously a parking operator is going to want to charge from the moment you get in. Uh, again, that could devastate 
our effort at turning around Westwood Village. So where are we in terms of, of control of those issues? And I'm sure there, there are similar issues, for instance, in uh, Jose Huizar's district uh, around Broadway, which again, they're also trying to do some similar things and, and even called Bring Back Broadway. Ours could be called Bring Back Westwood Village, but it's the same thing. If you Woo want to, <laughs> Woo Back Westwood Village, exactly, <laughs> there you go. Um, if you want to do the economic development and your parking structure policies are, are working in absolute contradiction, which could happen if you're only looking at the benefit to the parking structure. How, how do we, in this process, maintain uh, some ability to dictate policy in such a way that, that parking profit won't be the only overriding concern? I'll, I'll take a first attempt at it, and then Renee can, can talk about it from the operational standpoint. Um, in the contract, we have the flexibility to be able to make modifications depending on what's happening with parking. I'm over parking, not only the facilities, but parking meters as well as express parking or area. And so we're looking at policies as to how the facilities can augment the parking policies and strategies that you want to move forward with. So in the contract we have, for example, they have to submit a marketing plan to us. We have to approve that. We have oversight over it. It's a give and take in terms of what we would be doing there for the marketing. That would mean that as DOT, we would work with council offices in that district to really sort of come up with a comprehensive strategy because you're absolutely right. Parking is the real issue, and so we have to look at it in a more broader sense. And so the policy is there that we're working to sort of facilitate that, but Renee can talk about as it relates to the specific contract how much flexibility you have in the contract. Uh, council member, the, the bottom line is, you know, to support what uh, my boss said, is basically the policy... Our office politics. <laughs> <laughs> the parking... Parking by itself uh, for LA DOT operated facilities is to provide parking to the public. And so the bottom line is the city has control over the policy over all facilities regardless of who's operating it, whether it's GSD or whether it is. And we work with the stakeholders, including council district office, the bid, uh, property alliance like in Hollywood and so on. So it, it's not the money unless the CAO has a different take on it, but bottom line is the, it is the community's um, need that we would have to first have a priority. So in your case, we would have to look at what is the need, what is important, and we will direct our parking operator to follow the same. It is us who dictates the rates. It is us who dictates what type of operation is in the facility to be used. Uh, it is the city uh, who will be responsible for making sure that the city uh, or the pu public, re public parking patrons are fully uh, serviced and at the same time given, uh, given them the, ser uh, the, the safety and and uh, make sure that everything uh, is under the direction that where we're going with regards to city councils uh, or districts uh, point. Um, that is true in every, every district. Uh, we've worked with CD8 as far as their need, as far as a parking facility. We've worked with council member bonus district as to, you know, Venice facility and so on. So basic, the basic point and bottom line is the city, through the department, is the one who's responsible for all the policy and all the uh, things that is required or that's needed by the community to help and provide service to the community. But I assume some of this has to be worked out up front with the operator. I mean, the operator would come in to Westwood and say, I can maximize this and bring it in at X. And you say, well, but 20% of the people don't pay because you've got uh, you know, one or two hour, whatever it winds up being uh, as it goes forward, um, free parking. So they say, what? You know, we were told we could maximize it and you're telling us uh, 20 or 30% of this is going to be free. So I, I think 
it's not something you can work out afterwards with them. It's something obviously that if we're going to continue in, in that circumstance, they need to know it up front. Sir, I think uh, they are aware that uh, it is different to handle uh, a privately owned parking facility uh, and those that are owned by a, uh, a city. Um, this is not uh, different in other cities or municipalities or uh, government-owned uh, parking facilities that the primary uh, customer, I should say, or the primary reason is service to the community or the public, uh, park, uh, public parking patrons rather than just the money. Uh, that is the mantra that we have even with the existing and current uh, parking operators, private operators, that the public comes first rather than the money because we are a city uh, entity that is servicing the public. And I would say that the contract award allows us that flexibility to do that. We take your, your comments and we will make sure that that, that that happens because in parking you have to be able to allow for um, those kinds of things. You have to be flexible in order to deal with the parking issue that we have. And obviously, in, in the ones that I think are, are as economically critical, like Jose Wezar is the other example, um, I certainly wouldn't want to find out that um, some major project had been conditioned on taking a certain amount of parking from a structure and that it was given to a retail project and taken from, from residents and suddenly... Uh, the parking structure again was producing more money, but uh, was was no longer serving the purpose for for the residents and customers. So we're we're pretty confident we can do that without causing the kind of harm that I'm nervous about. I'm confident that we could do it, and since I've taken over parking, part of my background has been policy, and so I recognize and know that we need to address some of the policy issues up, up front before we get to implementation, because usually I get the phone calls and say, do fix this, and we should have had those discussions up front, so we are being very vigilant about stepping in, doing the planning process to be able to address parking, because sometimes parking gets the short shrift when you're doing the planning process, so we're working to move forward to doing that a lot more than we have been. Well, I appreciate it. I think I've made my concerns clear enough, but um, if I haven't, I would just say, if you do it wrong in Westwood Village, you'll be dealing with a different council member because I'll have been recalled. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'll be like that in CD5. Before. I'll be looking for another job, too. So. Yeah, didn't miss it by much the last time with my predecessors. I'm amazed you've got free parking in that close proximity to Don Shoup at, at UCLA. That's like poking a dog with a stick. Um, that's amazing. Uh, Mr. Krikorian. Um, right, let me just ask... Uh, a, fo a follow-up on, on the technology stuff. Yes, sir. Because uh, it's still nagging at me a little bit. If a cool new, let's say, CD11-based company, uh, not beyond imagining, uh, <laughs> came up with an app that we loved, and it meant that uh, in three years, you, with a sensor in the ground, you could just drive into any parking lot, don't even need to use your credit card, it just automatically uh, 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 takes it. Um, could we say as the city, parking lot operators, you need to be doing this? Yes. And if that meant that in the process it was much less costly for them to operate that lot, we can then uh, uh, require that they charge us less for operating that lot? Yes. I'm going to hold you to that. You can hold I'm going to have a hackathon right. to develop that app. This is what the <laughs> council member Kurt says, then if, that is, if I can, then I have to look for another <laughs> job. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, then uh, my recommendation would be we move this forward to council. Any objections? Okay. We will move forward. Thank Committee you, member zero two reports for Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. You. Uh, th there's, a, there's one more speaker card. Right, but, and also, the, 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 we have before you our two reports from the CAO. Yep. E both report, each report has a set of recommendations, which we'll need to approve as part of your action today. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll approve both of that. But to be, but to be uh, uh, proper about it, we should take the public comment yes. first. I, I do want to encourage folks. I, I usually am just going to do public comment at the beginning of items. I'd like to get public input because usually we tend to decide as we 
go through questions. So I'd like to get the public input before. So in the future, folks can get their cards in early. Thank you, staff. And if uh, Salomon uh, Charlie or Charlie can come up. DOT, uh, general service. I would, my concern was that you know they, all of this you know the the self animated system all the what they trying to do, but they use Highland you know as one of the main thing they use. But Highland's already owned by private. They are to be ran by private people. Also, like Robertson, there's only one entrance and one exit. If you have an automated system and nobody's there to run that parking lot. I mean, and you have a hundred monthly people trying to get out their parking lot. I mean, what what's the next step for that? I also look, you know, it is going to be cheaper, but it's like if you're running, if you're going to go and buy some Payless shoes to run, it's not going to work as good as Nike. You know, and I, my my point is that just like look it over thoroughly good, you know, because some of it there's a lot of loopholes in it, you know, that that need to be ironed out. With, with this, you know, with DOT, because I, you know, I came from the private sector before. I worked yeah. before with Crown Parking, and I'm now with the city at the same parking lot. And previous, the previous, they, they never cleaned up because, you know, they don't pay proper wage to the, to the employees. The employees didn't care because they're not getting in, you know, the, the, the you know, money. They just go, you know, clock in, clock out. While if you're a city employee, run a, a facility, you know, is a higher standard you know, of, of operation, period, compared to a private person. You know, that's just, you know, com, you know common knowledge of, of who get paid, you know, a little bit more would do a, a better job because they have to protect, you know, their bread and butter. So I just want to say, you know, thank you guys for ta taking the, the case, whatever, but just look it through, please. Thank you. Thank you very Mr. much. Sir? Yes. Uh, that uh, made me think a little bit. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not sure we actually got an answer on the employee question. We got an answer in terms of numbers, but not whether we've made proper arrangements to uh, find the other positions uh, within City Hall. So I wonder if we could just get a quick answer to that. Are we are we certain that we are able to place them as we go through this process? I have representatives here from our CAO employee relations and then also GSD personnel to address any questions you have on the placement process and how that would work. Hi, Please. Paul Gerard, CAO employee relations division. Dan Yoshimura from the personnel department. So that's exactly the question. How does it work? Are we, are we certain that we have places for the employees that will be displaced? Uh, the city's policy is to place all full-time and, and regular half-time employees, and we're doing that now, as I understand. Yes. The, in, a, in a similar situation with the convention center, we, are, we, we have gone through placement, uh, a placement process. For this specific um, project, we would have to take a look at it once, once it was approved. We have to take a look at how many people are involved and specifically how we would approach it. But you are certain you find a place for them? The, the city's policy has been that they will make placements. Okay, because I know for, there, there for some of us, if, if we don't have that certainty, uh, it, that would make us much less likely is, to support. Is that support. one of the policies that we make that is enacted, or is that one of the policies we make that is just nodded over? I'm sorry. We make policies all the time, but sometimes it takes a lot of follow-up to make sure that they're implemented. You said it's the city's policy. The only time that I've had experience with this particular policy has been with the convention center, and we have placed all full, full and half-time employees. Uh, might some of the employees uh, wind up working at the lots under the new management? There is that possibility in the contract for the contractors to um, see if any of the part-time employees are interested in working for them. Then, then what I might suggest, I, I was struck by Mr. S uh, Solomon's comment uh, about some of the, the physical limitations of the, the lots with one ingress and egress to, to have some of the technological solutions. Mr. LeBange will be sad to, to miss me saying that perhaps technology is not the answer to everything. Uh, and that... You, you have in, in your report a recommendation of 
how things are phased in, and I think you you said it would start with the smaller lots. You first, we'd first start with the lots that are not um, that do not employ GSD employees. Okay, all right. So it, because th there may be some of those where where they may wind up keeping you know employees in in place, and so that might be the place where we want to look to, to see if right. we can have some folks stay. When the department um, looks t at the different lots with each of the proposed contractors, they'll determine which lots they want to upgrade to technology or which they may decide wants to keep um, a person at that location. I think I'm good. Okay. Uh, so, uh, now, Mr. Corcoran. Yeah, I, I actually do have a technology question, and this is kind of a, mm -hmm. a, a very different angled uh, technology question because I think when we're when we think in terms of technology with parking structures or lots, we're usually thinking of the gates and so on. But what about the actual physical infrastructure of the lot itself? And and what I'm thinking of here is um, there is a a business in my district that manufactures scalable automatic parking structures that actually move the cars and um, you you drive it in it moves it up the stack um, and then it brings it back quickly so if an operator on a surface lot say wanted to install technology like that which would significantly increase the capacity of the lot and therefore significantly increase the potential revenues to be derived over the course of the management contract how would that work? Who would would the uh, would the private operator be able to make that investment, even though it's a an infrastructure investment into a city-owned property? What would be the approval process that the city would have in that? Would we share in the increased capacity revenues? How how would that play out? I'm back. Um, any ultimate, any, any anything that goes into the lot would have to have enter into an agreement. So in that case, that is a capital expenditure that yeah. has to be in. So um, normally, um, we look into what possibilities that came in, and I agree with you that that's the new thing, especially in the east, in the east coast. Not necessarily here, in because of the earthquake that we have, uh, or earthquake. And, and so already gotten building and safety approval. We're ready right, to right. roll and, it and, out. And so what we city. need to do is we'll just have to go through the process, enter into an agreement with them, uh, and what will happen from from the projection that I will see will be we can do a profit sharing or at this uh, or do a ground lease agreement where at the end of a long 50 years or 99 years thereof we you know take over. Uh, the, oper the the ownership of the the equipment that's what you call the automated parking sir right so it's it's not anticipated that sort of thing is not anticipated by the current uh, agreements it would have to be separately negotiated on a per facility kind of basis I think the way we did the parking agreement is it's flexible enough to see what is best for the community and what's best for the city. Uh, the benefits that it will derive, uh, that we will derive from any project would, is, could be included in the agreement. And if there needs to be an amendment, there is that flexibility to amend the contract. We're not excluding anything at this point. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. And, and I have to say, just a thought on that, I know it probably won't come up very often either because it's expensive enough that to make it work, you need incredible demand and density. And West Hollywood, which is probably one of the densest places with the most need you could find, uh, I started suggesting this about 20 years ago, and they are finally about to break ground on the first one. So it'll be interesting to see uh, how it works out. And they looked at all kinds of private places and it only wound up being uh, the city hall parking lot that, that was feasible. Okay, so we will move this forward to council. Uh, do we have a date yet for council? We don't. I'll work with your staff to set a date. Sure. Thank you. All right, okay, thank you, Mr. Parks. Uh, so we'll adjourn the, that concludes the special meeting, right? Yes. yes. We'll adjourn the special meeting. We'll go back to the regular meeting.
He wants to go to the church. Just go straight to the church. If I recall the August 13th, originally. Like, it's on the agenda. That's notice. Yeah. As soon as it quiet. He's, he's desperate. Well, also, Duke says vote. Folks, if you could exit the room quickly so we can continue. Thank you. Oh, you can have it. Yeah. Okay, uh, we are now back in the regular committee meeting. Uh, having spent about 45 minutes talking about parking, now we're going to spend a little time talking about walking. Uh, so, uh, item number two. Item number two is an LADOT report relative to bicycle and pedestrian counts, enhanced data collection pursuant to the Bonin O'Farrell motion. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It is an honor as the city's first pedestrian coordinator to have the opportunity to address um, the board. So thank you. Uh, in response to a motion dated September 10th, 2013, there was a request to, for the department to better assess its capabilities for um, collecting and managing active transportation count volumes, active transportation being defined as walking and biking data. Cities are increasingly exploring and implementing um, treatments and networks um, and counts provide that really critical data for project development, prioritizing projects, and doing before and after project evaluation. Nationally, transportation departments are deepening and strengthening that collection of volume for pedestrians and bicyclists, as well as evolving new met methodologies and tapping new technologies. Active transportation can be a very powerful metric for the city in its evaluation of meeting the mayor's um, back to basic goals and inform a public dialogue to create a more sustainable and livable city, that's number four, and partner with citizens and civic groups to build a greater city, number nine. Currently three areas of LADOT focus on collecting active transportation counts, um, LADOT planning, the survey group, and the newly formed active transportation group. Um, countdowns have been traditionally um, managed by our advocacy group. Uh, for citywide baselines, we have been dependent on biannual bike and pedestrian counts, again by LACBC and Los Angeles Walks. This past year, in fact, they tapped over 400 volunteers um, to do counts at 120 intersections. It is now time to support a transition to a city management of this vital data, and in partnership with Metro, UCLA, LACBC, LADOT has in fact developed an interim data collection template that expands its current counts around intersections to include not just vehicles but also bikes and pedestrians. At the same time, LADOT is piloting a new capture method for volume along a corridor, i.e. not at intersections, and this is called a screen line count. We have in fact already been piloting this approach in the Broadway dress rehearsal pre-installation uh, count, um, the 10 corridors, and likewise this screen line account will be used at all pre and post uh, evaluations for People Street projects. So to ensure momentum of LA's DOT's um, transition to count practices that really comport with national best practices, LADOT will be convening a multi-divisional working group uh, comprised of LADOT IT, survey, planning, and the active transportation team to one, draft a counts, uh, counts policy for the department, and lastly, to formalize the processes to ultimately institutionalize every year a bike and bi bicycle and pedestrian count. I welcome your questions. First of all, thank you for the work you've done on this. Um, some people may wonder why this is important. I think it's very easy for, for, for folks who, who aren't actively engaged in active transportation issues to wonder why it's important to count the number of pedestrians or cyclists we have. And uh, I think it's fundamentally important because uh, 
we, we just spent a lot of time in the last conversation talking about technology. And this is a city where we're trying to focus more on technology and we're trying to focus more on data. And more and more we're trying to make our decisions based on data and based on metrics. And almost every transportation funding decision we make is made with an analysis of, of how many vehicles are moving, how fast vehicles can move, what's best for cars. Uh, and uh, we don't even have a good handle on how many people in the city, how many people cycle and how many people walk. There's folks from LA Walks and LA CBC who have good data. But until we start internalizing that data and can have faith in it at the city, so that when we're, we're sitting around the horseshoe downstairs, uh, it's, it's someone from, from the city family who's arguing to, to the, the decision makers. This data is real and this is what percentage of, of, of folks are, are biking and walking. So maybe we want to spend more than one or two percent of our transportation dollars on what may be 10 or 20 percent of, of the, the, the way people move around the city. So I'm, I'm very glad that we're doing this. I, as, as you know, I think I mentioned it when I put in the motion, that uh, I participated in the, the, the count last year, and uh, it, it's good that the city is, is doing this now. Um, will we be able to do the count ourselves next year, or will it still be uh, uh, LA Walks, LA CBC, uh, or will it be some sort of hybrid? I think there's an opportunity to explore a partnership. Mm -hmm. Again, we have, there are significant learnings, many thanks to our advocacy group for tapping into the national best practices. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's really a vital opportunity to partner with that group and explore some of the lessons <coughs> learned um, and also participate in working with them in developing the criteria as to the, the same set of locations. Again, there's a similar process in our planning group for the congestion management plan where they revisit the same set of locations. So similarly, I think in working with, um, in partnership with the groups that have done the bike counts, they have an understanding of those key locations and working hand in hand with developing those criteria. And uh, so when you come back in, in eight months, Correct. Uh, what, what are you gonna be presenting to us then? What I'd like to do at that time is bring forward the policy from our department. Mm -hmm. I think there's a the time is now for the multiple divisions within LADOT um, to focus on active transportation and how do we tap the technology, the data group, the project development team. And secondly, there's a, a wonderful opportunity for the city of Los Angeles to join New York and San Francisco in doing annual bike and pedestrian counts. So the goal in eight months is to come back with a schedule and timeline as to when we'll be launching those annual counts. So New York and San Francisco already do this? Yes, they do. I hate when we're not first. If you can come back in eight months and also tell us something we can do that New York and San Francisco haven't done. With, <laughs> with There's probably some folks in the room who can suggest it. With um, And uh, the, the, the results of the bike count that, that LA Walks and LA CBC did this year, those results we're going to have in May? In, in May, which will be well-timed because it's bicycle month, right? Excellent. Good. Um, uh, colleagues, any questions? Uh, Thank you. I think this is really an important step forward, as our chair described. The lack of uh, useful data when it comes to active transportation is a real handicap for us in, in doing effective planning. Um, in that regard, I actually have some significant concerns about annual counts. And the big problem with annual counts is they're widely publicized and widely known. And if there are active efforts to get people to go out and walk and ride during the count, it's not useful data. It's skewed data. If we do a bicycle count during Ciclavia, we're going to get a significantly wrong bit of information. And so th the whole concept of an annual count, I think, is, is wrong to begin with. We should be doing regular counts. In the same way we do traffic studies, um, we don't announce ahead of time that on such and such a day we're going to be doing a traffic study on such and such a block. We just do it. And I, I, to me, it's, it's not useful information if it can be skewed by participants. So um, I, I would much prefer to see a regularized process of doing a 
they count throughout the year, you know, an intersection on this week and then another intersection another week and, and so forth, rather than saying, bicyclists get ready because we need you to come out and, you know, ride on a beautiful spring day during the, the count. Uh, it just, that's not accurate information. So, and I'd be interested to hear what the experiences have been in, in other cities, again, since we're looking at best practices, um, in trying to make this data accurately reflect what's really going on out there so that we can uh, make our transportation decisions accordingly. Two good points. Um, from the national best practices perspective, there is a focus on doing it in the fall time frame. Um, again, everybody picks a different time, but the reason they focus on the fall is that schools are in, and, and relative to the full school year, that is really the optimal time to get a realistic count. Um, to your point, we, again, can explore that as part of the, the formalizing of our, our process is whether we do phases of counts um, across the year. What's working in our favor and the, uh, the Bicycle Data Clearinghouse manual that was created and funded by SCAG um, actually starts to highlight some of the key technologies that can be used for doing counts. So we are moving into an era where we can start placing the technology in those locations and it can, we can schedule it to run at different times. So to your point, there's an opportunity to place those technologies out there and, quote, turn them on mm -hmm. at different times so that, in essence, we can patchwork a series of different timed uh, counts to come up with an annual baseline. So again, I think you call out some very significant um, factors that we can discuss as part of the working group. Great. Thank you. In, in the meantime, our plan to do a count on Wilshire Boulevard uh, a week from Sunday has been foiled. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Kretz. Or, or you can obviously do something that's a hybrid. I mean, you could do it annually, change the date, try not to publicize this very much. I think Mr. Kikorian makes a good point. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, we do an am annual homeless count. It's probably the same time every year, and I don't think the homeless organized to <laughs> generate more visibility. But uh, I think this one we'd have to work at it to avoid it being, having it skewed in some way, but I, I would imagine it could be done. And to Mr. Bonin's point, uh, I suggest we want to do something first that we could microchip cyclists. Uh, I promise you no other city will have done it before. <laughs> No comment on that. Uh, nor, nor will we. But uh. <laughs> now, what we should do, Mr. Bonin, is do our speed study a week from this weekend on Wilshire. Then we can post lower speed limits. Ooh, <laughs> ooh, I like that. I'm all for that. Um, uh, also, oh, we got uh, two speakers uh, on this: uh, Eric Bruins and Antonio Ramirez. Uh, you can stay there because we have more questions. Thank you very much. Thank you all of you for uh, recognizing the importance of these counts. They definitely have been something that we started back in 2009, and we're very happy to see the city take the mantle. Um, I would love to not pu publicize them. I don't know how you get 400 volunteers to give their time, um, but I can guarantee you that, if anything, the count numbers are depressed on those days because those 400 volunteers are not riding their bikes. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm not really worried too much about that, given that we've done the same thing in the same, in the same way for those, those number of years. Um, and so we just kind of haven't seen that. Um, we also validate we do do counts that are not the annual public size counts. We did them, for example, on Westwood Boulevard with some UCLA grad students. And I know the fact that we didn't publicize them caused the homeowner, one of the homeowners to actually call the police on our counters as a suspicious person. So we can't kind of, you know, we're, we get in trouble either way, um, but this data has definitely been absolutely critical in, in judging the effectiveness of our, of our programs. Um, for example, if, if we didn't do the counts, we wouldn't know that over 300 cyclists ride on Westwood Boulevard every single day. Um, and those are the types of, of decisions that we need to be able to make based on actual data. So, thank you. And you, you guys don't feel like the city's uh, sort of uh, horning in on your territory by doing its own count, do you? I want to get out of this business. Please take it over. <laughs> I have better things to do with my time. Uh, 
Uh, Ms. Ramirez. Thank you very much. This is a public safety issue. One major problem that many of us pedestrians encounter all the time while walking on the sidewalks are these reckless Latinos and gangbangers who use their bicycles as a form of drug and criminal transportation and tripping over the pedestrians without any remorse. These criminal felons and Latino gangbangers are engaged in the street criminal empire and do not respect our city codes, much less exercise any human dignity for all pedestrians. We hope that through your enhanced data collection, you are able to zoom in on them and arrest and deport them all for using the city streets and sidewalks to transport contraband, drug dealing, gang stalking, fear and intimidation, obstructing the pedestrians' access to freely roam about unhindered with safety and protection, and also conspiracy to commit crimes against humanity. So I say focus, focus, and focus on providing safety routes for law-abiding American citizens, for we are a great and valuable asset to the city of Los Angeles. And with that, I wouldn't be here if I didn't believe that. And uh, so I say, city of Los Angeles, can you deliver? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jessica, I saw you wandering around with the speaker card. Did you want to comment? I'm sorry, Dan. Go ahead, please. I just would suggest we should do automated counters, and that we don't need to... Uh, Jessica Meany, Safe Routes to School National Partnership. My preference would to count um, people who are walking and biking the same way we count cars with automated counters. San Francisco does it, New York does it. We don't need people. We should just make it part of our transportation network. That, that would be great. And if as part of the working group, that's one of the approaches to that team is to look at those technologies, and we have automatic um, count technologies available to us, and recognizing that the, the advantage of doing the annual counts, again, we may not publicly say one, is that we really have an opportunity to start building a database where we are establishing baseline and can show trends over time. So it's really critical to formalize and institutionalize those annual counts so that we have no, um, no means for measuring change over time. Yeah. Right. And just lastly, I'd say right now our Los Angeles County Department of Public Health has bought these and is giving them to cities that they're grantees and they're testing it. So we have local expertise already, and that's the movement I think we want to see as a city and a region. Thanks. Great. I'd also recommend, uh, whether it's part of this or just as part of your, your, your general work plan, is that um, we, we look to see what, what we can do to gather data about uh, not just where folks are what, what intersections folks are walking or cycling through. But if we can begin through technology, I think, to uh, gather data about where those trips originate and end. Yeah. Uh, I know in, in San Francisco, there's, there's an app, Cycle Tracks, that a lot of uh, cyclists use that, that, trap, uh, that track data. Um, people volunteer to do it. Uh, something like that might be something worth exploring. Uh, and I always want to, to, to say to any of our underfunded departments that are eager to look for technology stuff, you know, work with the, 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 the mayor's uh, tech folks and, 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 and those of us who represent a lot of these tech startups. We're happy to do hackathons on stuff like that, and I'm very eager to do something where we might be able to get the tech community involved in a way to help us gather the kind of data we need. And fundamentally, I think there's, again, a significant opportunity to go from the data collection into the data repository. Today there are some interim steps of data collection, translating spreadsheets, getting into databases, but to your point, um, Council Member Bonin, there are technologies where you can use that technology in the field, collect it, and it's immediately um, computed into databases. So we're increasingly being more efficient. Mr. Uh, I, I don't know if you're looking at pedestrian safety issues as, as part of any of this effort or not. Uh, but since it got mentioned, uh, I thought I'd just flag again uh, uh, one of the oddities in terms of pedestrian safety in my district. Fairfax Avenue is a quirky combination of very old, frail, Jewish, mostly Jewish seniors and the ultra-hip um, uh, skateboarding stores. And so you have... Uh, uh, a number of uh, skateboarding customers that don't really pay much attention to anything else going on other than their desire to skateboard up and down Fairfax um, uh, with a fair number of complaints of frail senior citizens being knocked over by them. Um, so I don't know if we looked at those pedestrian safety issues, but if we do, uh, uh, I don't have any obvious answers, but it's not, it's, it's the least ideal um, grouping of, of uh, two kinds of retail 
if we can figure out a way to uh, to make that work a little better, uh, I'd certainly be looking for solutions. And one of the templates, as far as, far as first of all, I'm a resident of that neighborhood, so I know it well. Um, the template, the screen line count, actually does take into account those bicycles that are on sidewalk versus not. So we will be able to start being able to um, collect the data on that and, and address how how regular that is where bikes and pedestrians are sharing that space. And of course, the, the bicycle versus pedestrian issue goes beyond that, but the skateboarding issue versus pedestrians is really, somewhat, at least in my district, is very unique to that one spot. We actually do record that data. Um, if you are if you are using a mobility device like a, anything with wheels on the sidewalk, it gets recorded. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I just wanted to reiterate the importance of the point that you made about um, data on beginning and ending points, and and this is not just an issue of you know curiosity. This this actually is critically important data in guiding policy decisions that we have to make and routing decisions that we have to make on bicycle infrastructure, for example, because um, in particular areas there, are, there may be multiple bicyclist needs. There might be the, the more local recreational um, kind of uh, bicycling community that's predominant in a particular neighborhood. There might be a more commuting uh, group that is passing through to get from a distant point to a, f a further distant point. Uh, there might be some, uh, a, a, pre a predominance of them might be trying to get to transit hubs. There, there's a whole bunch of different considerations that go into figuring out how do we build an infrastructure that's useful to our customers um, when we don't know really what those customers, where those customers are going. And so um, the count is important, but the um, intention, I guess, and the, the destination of the, um, particularly with bicyclists, I think, is, is really critically important in making those decisions as well. All right, so we will uh, move this forward. We'll approve the department's recommendations and look forward to hearing back in uh, eight months. Great. Thank you very much. So because I like to work well with Mr. Koretz, uh, I've artfully pre-planned a segue. He was talking about uh, uh, pedestrian safety, and so we're going to uh, go right into item number three about crossing guards. Item number three is an LADOT report relative to the city's crossing guard program pursuant to an Engliter, Blumenfeld, Bond, and Krikorian motion. Detailed. Good afternoon. If everybody could uh, ID themselves for the record. Good afternoon, Brian Hill, Deputy Chief, Parking Enforcement, Traffic Control and Division. Greg Civelli, Chief, Parking Enforcement. Brian O, Office of uh, Mitchell Englander. Great. Right. Thanks, everybody, for being here today. So um, as I recall, uh, back in January, Mr. Englander uh, introduced a motion asking DOT to report on the city's crossing guard program. Um, there were a number of uh, particular things he wanted the department to look at. Uh, we had this item uh, in committee before you wrote the report, and we aired out some of those concerns, and you've now completed the report. If you could uh, summarize your findings, and then after that, if Mr. Englander, you could give us, uh, Mr. Englander's staff member, if you give us your boss's reaction to it. Thank you, Brian. Yes, uh, good afternoon. As you mentioned, in February, the department prepared a report in response to the concerns that this committee had regarding the administration of the crossing guard program. And so uh, we prepared that report, laid out the nature in which the crossing guards, uh, the recruitment, the review of accidents, safety record, the training, uh, issues related to determination as to where crossing guards are assigned. And so uh, through that process we prepared this report and as you indicated you have that now before you in essence what we have is uh, the uh, crossing guard employees are hired just like any other city employee there is a test they do have to go through uh, MSD a medical services division to be certain that they can perform the functions 
uh, of the job. Uh, they are then either assigned or they're, many of them come to us uh, with interest to provide service at the time. They would come to us with interest to provide service at a specific school. Sometimes they have relatives there or it's close to their home. So sometimes people come to us for that reason. Uh, but ultimately, um, our, we have what's called lead guards that go out and observe them, perform their service. Uh, we did find a weakness, as I mentioned, at the last uh, at the last meeting in that area where our leads weren't getting out as often as necessary because they were filling in at intersections where we have vacancies. So they aren't able to perform. They're actually performing crossing guard services and not evaluating the other crossing guards. So that's a weakness that we've addressed or we're working on addressing. And so, um, as you know, we have a shortage. Ultimately, we have 507 intersections that are authorized for crossing guards and only 380 crossing guards. So we have a, a large number of crossings that are not covered and we daily get requests for additional. So uh, daily this, get what? Uh, requests for additional guards. Um, and so uh, this is basically to outline what the process has been. And I know this came up <clears throat> as a result of a liability issue. But subsequent to that, we've had a couple of collisions that have also put the spotlight on the program. And Mr. Engel, just office? Yeah. Um, we thank you for the, the full report. Um, I thought it was, we thought it was very comprehensive. I think there's one point that the council member had um, wanted um, some more clarification on um, the, I think it's on page three, you mentioned uh, when staff members are um, returning from a medical leave. It's a little cloudy. I mean, I, essentially, you're, you're getting a doctor's note to, to authorize coming back. But, you know, if, if someone is gone for an extended period of time versus someone that's maybe out just one day from a cold, how do we differentiate between the two just to ensure that you know, when the staff is back, they're 100% uh, ready to go? Well, the supervising staff would review the medical documentation presented by the employee, and the doctor essentially has indicated that the employee does not have any restrictions in terms of the nature of their work uh, and their ability to perform the job. However, if there's a concern in reviewing the medical certification as prepared by the supervisors, uh, we have the ability to request that MSD conduct a further evaluation of the employee and, and their ability. And essentially, MSD will consult with that uh, employee's doctor to ensure that they are, in fact, capable, that they understand the nature of the work, that they um, have the duties and, and specifications for the employment so that they fully, that the patient or the employee's doctor fully understands what is required of them in, in the day-to-day -day tasks that they're asked to perform. So once that uh, dialogue, if it's necessary, occurs between MSD and the patient's doctor, MSD will advise the department that the employee is uh, capable or is not capable of performing their their duties so that uh, you know we're we're not placed in a position wherein uh, we're placing someone at risk uh, obviously in, in placing the public at risk by employing a person um, who doesn't have full capability for their their task as asked but before it gets to MSD before <clears throat> to get to MSD there has to be there's a non-medical supervisor that makes that call, right? Well, you determines whether or not, you know, after reviewing the charts, um, if someone would be fit for, to return back to duty. Well, generally the supervisors, the, the supervisors and lead guards will evaluate the employee's uh, performance at the intersection. But as I indicated earlier, uh, we have uh, been weak in that area because of the lack of, of guards. Okay, go ahead. Maybe I can, because I am seeing the ambiguity here. Let me see if I can just walk it through. So somebody's out for an extended period of time. First thing they have to do is get a medical return to work form from their physician, which they then present to their supervisor. Correct. So the physician is approving the return to work, That's making correct. a medical decision about the return to work. The supervisor then has the opportunity to physically observe the employee upon receipt of that medical return to work form. And if there's a question, then there would be an additional referral to MSD to for further medical services division. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. I, I think that 
it gives me some comfort about the process. I mean, we know that there have been at least some examples of times where that process hasn't worked as we had hoped, and as you mentioned, to create a liability situation. Um, that was a unfortunate situation, but um, but the process is in place. Um, and then if the supervisors are staffed up and in fact doing supervision rather than serving as, as crossing, performing crossing guard duties themselves, then you have an extra layer of um, evaluation there because right. you see them actually on the job. Yes, sir. So that then gets to that, that point. Um, the fact that you have far more approved intersections than you have available crossing cards still. Um, is I, I know you've had tremendous challenges in recruiting because it's you know it's a, a job that you only serve for a couple hours a day and it, it's hard to recruit people for that. Is your is the main challenge in filling those positions a, a budgetary one or a recruitment problem or a combination of those? It's uh, they haven't recruited or employed for five years. Uh, it's a budgetary decision. Um, the city uh, CAO and CLA's office has made a determination that uh, the, the program um, is expensive and it's not a requirement or a mandate to our city to provide this service. So in this fiscal crisis, this has been one of the areas in which they've chosen to reduce. So for the positions that you have that are funded, you've had no, no problem in filling those positions? We have, again, we have not filled any positions for five years. As, as people transition out, retire, uh, or leave, those positions are, are, are swept. I see. So you've lost, you've actually lost positions through attrition. Yes. Perhaps as many as uh, a couple hundred. Over yeah, over the last five years. We lose about 12 to 16 a year uh, crossing cards. Okay. Mr. Kretz? <clears throat> so... Uh, I would think this is something we should be taking a broader look at through the process of the, the budget, whether we actually want to eliminate this service and just let it uh, trid out over the next five or ten years, or whether we actually think we have a duty to protect the safety of the kids that we're protecting if they happen to be in the areas where we still have crossing guards. Um, I can guarantee that will be considered closely in the Budget and Finance Committee. Uh, I, I would suggest it should be. Um, and obviously, if we decide this is something we want to do on an ongoing basis, I would think we want to give direction to at least start hiring to attrition uh, and maybe a little more start to build it back up. Thank you. Uh, one of the questions I had, I noted uh, one of the findings of your report or one of the things that stood out for me was it said that over the past three years, there have been six traffic accidents involving crossing guards, vehicle versus pedestrian. And it states that each accident was non-preventable, and the police report noted the crossing guard was not at fault. That's good. Um, too often, pedestrians, pedestrians and cyclists get the blame for getting in the way of a, a motor vehicle, and they get uh, sort of blamed for, for the collision, um, or it's the fault of no one. So I'm wondering, in these cases, if the crossing guard wasn't at fault, um, does that mean the motorist was, or did LAPD find that no one was? In these instances, uh, and I know since I've been here, there, there's been uh, two or three, that the motorist was deemed at fault based on uh, their driving conduct. Okay. Uh, and I noted in the report there was a, a reference to the term non-preventable accident. What is a non-preventable accident? Well, essentially, a, a non-preventable accident indicates that there was no affirmative action that could have been taken to avoid that, where the situation was such that a person was crossing and the motorist ran ran a stop sign and, and ran into uh, the pedestrian. It, you know, there's not pre preventable from that standpoint. Or nothing a crossing card could have done for. <clears throat> But if someone was texting, obviously, that was preventable, but the crossing guard. Correct. Okay. Right. All right. Um, I also note in the report that um, it said that the LA DOT Parking Enforcement Accident Review Board, review board uh, does the reviewing of the collisions involving uh, crossing guards. 
who's on that board and when did it get going? Those are members in, within the organization, the Department of Transportation. There's a little bit of a, a confusion on that, and I tried to clarify with Brian just the other day. Uh, or excuse me, yeah, with Brian. Oh, I forgot two Brians here. Um, but uh, the, basically, the, the accident review board has to do with when our employee is driving our vehicle or they're driving a vehicle of their own in the course of scope of their employment. It's reviewed by the accident review board. What wasn't reviewed and what's asked to be reviewed now is when a crossing guard is performing their crossing duties and a collision occurs, are we looking at those? And the, pre the previous accident review board was not. Now we are. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to ask a tangentially related question. Uh, we've never done middle schools, right? We've never done crossing guards there. There's no chance we're going to anytime soon uh, because we have a long way to go just to get back to where we were on, on the, the elementary schools. <clears throat> I've got a middle school in my district uh, in Brentwood where there have been a, a scary number of accidents recently, Paul Revere Middle School. And, uh, you know, of course, LAUSD is saying, call the council office and demand crossing guards, which obviously not going to be able to deliver. I'm interested in trying to get um, the school and the parents to do something at least on a volunteer basis. Is there, are there best practices that you're aware of that they can follow, or is there a uh, a, a volunteer training program available that, 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 that you folks might even do? Currently in the city, we don't have a volunteer program. We, uh, there are private providers of crossing guards, mm -hmm. but that's a contractual issue as well as a, uh, an issue with the Muni Code. The Muni Code designates who can and cannot direct traffic in a city street. Uh, currently, volunteers are not on that list. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it would you know, take a, a modification to the law to, to add that to it. It's not saying it can't be done. It's just currently we cannot do it. Uh, well, there are other volunteer type programs that help in this scenario to try to limit uh, pedestrian access to vehicle uh, conflicts to vehicles, and that's like the valet program, student valet programs, where older age students arrange to open the doors, get the kids out, move the cars along. Uh, we have a couple of those in the city that we help provide uh, traffic control for to try to get the process as smooth as possible, get the kids in, get the, the parents on their way to work. Um, I'm wondering if you and the, the pedestrian coordinator could work together on, on making some recommendations about uh, uh, what the city can do to make it easier in places where we're not going to be having a crossing guard program to, to have volunteers or different alternatives to enhance uh, safety around the schools and key intersections. Absolutely. We have a dialogue with them uh, also because of Safe Route to Schools, so we can certainly uh, continue that conversation. Uh, that would be uh, very useful. Um, and, uh, okay. Um, all right, well, I had a note to ask you to do that, and I sort of ad-libbed it, so uh, I guess I'm ahead of the game today, Paul. Uh, we have one more speaker card. I, uh, I have one more question, oh, sure. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Um, it's sort of tangentially related. The, the, the intersections where we have crossing guards, we have city eyes and ears out there looking at traffic conditions at particular intersections, which are often, you know, the riskiest intersections, which is why we have a crossing guard there in the first place. Is there any process in place or is there any reporting procedure by which the crossing guards are invited to provide input to other parts of the department about signalization or signage or crossing time or any of the other things that might be considered from an engineering standpoint to make the intersection safer. Uh, and I, I have specific intersections that I have in mind that um, wh where I, I know that there's things that we could be doing better um, and the crossing guard knows probably better than anyone on the planet you know, what it is that happens at that intersection because they're there every single day during the busiest time of day. I know there's a, a procedure for reporting incidents that occur at the intersection. Let me just check with Lieutenant Jones. He's the one that oversees the program. Is there any program such as that? And if you could just identify yourself for the record. I'm Lieutenant Carl Jones. 
All the crossing guards and lead guards are provided with a fact-finding sheet. And at your location on Laurel? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I've been over there, and the traffic is horrendous. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of a large volume of vehicle traffic, and we have a large volume of pedestrians trying to cross at that location. Right. Uh, they have a great volunteer program at Carpenter Elementary, and we've been over there quite a, extensively. But all the crossing guards are provided a fact sheet to know any type of anomalies at the intersection if the intersection timing needs to be improved at the intersection. Uh, if there is an accident at the intersection, and they're supposed to know any type of accident, or in your case where the pedestrians are not actually on the curb and the cones are around there so the pedestrians can be safe in that corridor right there. So they have information, and it's provided to me. And I work with the engineers and the uh, Safe Routes to School individuals to provide solutions to the issues that we have. Correct. Thank you. Okay, so um, were there any of Mr. Engelman's concerns that went unaddressed? Uh, no, that's it. Okay, good. Thank okay. You. So I'll recommend we receive and file the department's report. Thank, Thank you. you. Speaker's cards? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, two uh, public comment cards, uh, Pat Hines and Jonathan Weiss. Thank you. I just wanted to respond, uh, Councilmember Bavon, and you were asking about uh, parent volunteers. I volunteer uh, at a middle school, and initially this year we had, uh, in the valet program, we had parents volunteering as crossing guards, and we were told we couldn't do that anymore. So there are a lot of parents who do want to do that, and if you could explore making a, a legal provision to do it. Because of the be muni great. code you weren't allowed to? Uh, the police or the, or the parking enforcement uh, or DOT told us we couldn't do it. I know when I was in elementary school, I was a safety, and, you know, standing, telling kids not to cross. So I'm sure parents can be trained better to do it, yep. and it could work within the city, and that could help to fill a, a gap you have. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Hi, Pat Hines from Safe Moves. Um, I think the, uh, the idea of a parent volunteer safety patrol or crossing guard is a, a great idea. It is works in other cities in California. And if you think about it, the parents at the schools are the most committed to their kids. They know the other parents who are often the violators. They know the community. And uh, many of our schools require parents to donate hours uh, to the school as part of their community service to the schools. I would uh, gladly work with the uh, pedestrian coordinator and with LADOT crossing guards to share some of the best practices and to identify the schools that I know currently would have parents that would stand up right away and become crossing guards. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I recommend we receive and file. That brings us to item number four, which is a DOT report relative to the Safe Routes to School Strategic Plan and Citywide School Safety Assessment Study. Hold on, staff. Um, we've got a number of speaker cards on this one. I'm going to remember to do these first. So uh, the first four, uh, oh, boy. Uh, Manal Aboelata. Did I get that anywhere close? Oh, good. Uh, Pat Hines, come on back up. Uh, Jonathan Weiss, come on back up. Uh, Eric Bruins, come on back up. Please. Good afternoon. My name is Manal Abalata. I'm Managing Director at Prevention Institute. We have supported Safe Routes to School policy at the state and local level for over a decade. We're pleased with the attention to Safe Routes to School, and there's still significant legwork needed to realize the full health, safety, and environmental protection this program has across the city, especially in our African American communities, where some of the infrastructure there literally discourages walking. Um, I'm also a mother of two boys who attend an LAUSD school in South LA. They walk and take the expo line to school. And although they only get physical education one time a week, they at least walk two miles a day. So children in all parts of LA need safer, more active, less noisy, less polluted routes to school. These improvements will help our seniors too. We would like to see the LAUSD Safe Routes to School Committee open up to include parent participation and involve in organizational partners across all council districts so that we have a unified citywide strategy. Also, we need great programs, great methods, and innovations to be shared across the entire city. What's working in East LA might be applicable in South LA. LAUSD is enormous, so we need robust staffing to ensure that active transportation issues are pushed 
in LAUSD to meaningfully engage the district and improve overall student well-being. Our city has the potential to pull down state funds for this work, but in order to do that, we need to increase our readiness by being strategic, ensuring collaboration with diverse stakeholders, and including that the city's predominantly African-American communities are engaged and benefit from these approaches. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so I'm Jonathan Weiss. I'm a full-time attorney. I'm also uh, I volunteer to sit on the on the bicycle advisory committee. I chair the advocacy and education um, subcommittee. Um, over the last year or so, we've been looking at uh, uh, the education program that's been going on for several years under I believe it's Prop A. Um, more recently, I've learned about the integrated integrated uh, SRTS plan, and I hope that as as they're looked at, they'll be looked at together and coordinated. Uh, there are a lot of good programs out there. One thing that when we passed the bike plan, when you passed the bike plan, I found to be really lacking was high school education. When people are deciding what their lifestyle is going to be or finding what their lifestyle is going to be, we're not teaching kids to be safe on the roads. Parents don't want their kids on the road if they don't feel that they're safe. There was a pilot program that Pat put on um, at Kennedy High School this Monday, and there were some really enthusiastic kids out there. Uh, there was a young lady who... Uh, despite some peer pressure, she decided she wanted to learn how to ride a bike. She was very excited. She got to learn how to ride a bike. Um, there were kids, of course, learning how to do it safely. Um, as you move forward with this, again, noting the bike plan, when you passed it, you had, I believe, 10 full-time staffers. I don't remember if it was in the bikeways division or on all of active transportation. Now there are seven and a half. Uh, there are grants that aren't being up. There, that aren't getting the attention because you don't have professional staff uh, grant writers. You're having interns write the grants. And I'm sure they do a great job, but I think you're leaving money on the table by not having the best grant writers you can find uh, for a lot of programs that are out there being aggressive, bringing home a lot of money to build the infrastructure that, that they're planning. And I, I want to compliment the active transportation folks. They're doing a great job in the city. And you for encouraging them. Um, thank you. Good afternoon. Eric Bruins, LA County Bicycle Coalition. Um, we are really supportive of the Safe Route School Strategic Plan. The, um, the team at LEDOT is doing an amazing job. They have submitted a budget request to increase their staffing, and we fully support giving them I mean, what we're hearing right now is that they're doing amazing work, but they don't have the, the people to really kind of seal the deal. And one of the, the, the key things that has fallen by the wayside is, is outreach. Um, we have a strategic plan that is really data-driven, and that's absolutely the right approach. But that selected the schools, and now that it's time for us to go and work with the schools, we need to recognize that these schools exist in neighborhoods, and so you need to do outreach both to the school community and to the neighborhood around the school. And that we haven't seen that yet, mostly because they don't have the resources to do it. So that requires both staffing up the Active Transportation Division, but also um, giving LADOT the freedom to, to contract with the community-based organizations that know those communities and can do that outreach on the ground. And my colleague Shannon will talk a little bit more about her success stories in South LA doing just that. Um, and we also want to um, echo the call to kind of reinvigorate the, uh, the Safe Routes School Task Force. I think there's a lot of folks like us that work on the citywide level and have a lot to offer if we are able to open up um, some of the task force meetings that have been taking place already. Thank you. I see, see everything that she said, the first one. But um, <laughs> my name is Pat Hines. I'm uh, Executive Director of Safe Moves. We are the contractor for LEDOT, the Bicycle uh, Safety Education and Transit Education Program. I wanted to remind um, City Council and, and the members here at the committee that although kids are vulnerable walking to and from school, we're leaving out a very important element, is that unsupervised time after school. A lot of our parents are working and not home until 6, 7 o'clock, and these kids are going home and playing in their neighborhoods and their city parks unsupervised and a lot of times many of our crashes are happening during that unsupervised time so it's really important that we educate the community to be the eyes of the parents who are working to keep a, a, a good look on the kids who are out there unsupervised. I want to support what the city has done. Uh, we're leading uh, the state in many programs um, the LADOT has done educational programs since 1983 for children, and we're seeing kids who are now in college who are actually coming back to work for Safe Moves, who actually went through the program when they were in elementary school. And I just want to stress that education is key. We can build a lot of things and we can promote and encourage, but if we don't educate kids, they won't have the skills to travel. And they certainly are going to be the, the commuters of tomorrow. And if we can educate kids in elementary school to bike and ride, their bicycles and to walk and to use public transportation, we're going to have a generation of those adult commuters. Thank you. 
Thank you. <clears throat> Next, uh, several speakers, uh, Gilberto Espinoza, Jessica Mini, Shannon Muir, Andres Ramirez. Hello, my name is Gilberto Espinoza from the Advancement Project. At Advancement Project, Urban Peace, we focus on reducing and preventing community violence. Our work tends to focus on high violence and gang entrenched communities. We previously conducted a safe routes to school project in the Belmont, uh, Belmont School Zone, and we're currently implementing a safe routes to school program in Watts. One of the innovative elements in uh, safe passages and safe routes to school work is that it, bringing, it brings traditional safe routes advocates who have traditionally focused on transportation and physical environment issues with community safety stakeholders, including those who want to see violence prevention happen from a more holistic public health approach that includes goals for increased physical activity. Traditionally, safe routes advocates do not think about violence issues. Community safety practitioners do not think about physical activity and public health experts. Um, public health experts uh, have, re have only recently begun intentional work around violence prevention. The, the project pushes each of, each of these traditional sectors to push the boundaries of their field to promote integration of inter environmental design, safety, and promotion of healthy, of healthy behavior. Not only do these stakeholders have to learn a new way of thinking about the, pro, uh, the problem, but we have to develop the cultural competency to work with residents and youth who are impacted by the violence and poor health out outcomes. We're excited to see that the city-wide the city vision for Safe Routes to School and other communities we work for are hungry for the support. We, we see great potential in Safe Routes to School and strategic approach, uh, the strategic approach being developed and the relationship building with LAUSD and LAPD. Good afternoon, committee members. My name is Jessica Meany from the Safe Routes to School National Partnership. Thrilled beyond belief to see this topic being robustly discussed and with all the partners at the table. This is something that, as you can imagine, um, our organization and I personally care deeply about. I think um, everyone who lives in the city of Los Angeles, regardless if you have a child, wants to live in a neighborhood where uh, our neighbors and, and their kids can walk to and go to school safely. One of my... Uh, like kudos to LADOT, to the council members' efforts to actually even starting this. This did originate with Council Member Rosendahl um, and Mayor Garcetti. One of my concerns is we have laid excellent groundwork for citywide vision. This is tremendous to see transportation policy taken at a city level and lifting all boats with this effort. But are the resources in place to do this? And now that we have the data that has really kind of teased out things, you're hearing from partners who are really ready to work with the city and help get this um, out there. Uh, I think many groups that I watch, People for Parks, Advancement Project, LACBC, Community Health Councils, Prevention Institute, countless others do work in schools, but we don't have a coordinated effort. One of the best things about Safe Routes to Schools is when parents are empowered to be leaders and to be solution providers. Some of the be best Safe Routes to School projects I've seen in the state and nationally often don't have any money. They have empowered community members. And I think DOT has laid tremendous groundwork. We can broaden the table and bring everyone in together. And really the best thing that could come out of this is the city of LA can't impact LAUSD's curriculum or do anything like that, but it can really focus transportation efforts to make sure our students and families can get to school safely and we have coordinated cost efficient efforts. Thanks. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Shannon Muir and I'm the coordinator of the Active Streets Program at the Los Angeles County Bicycle Coalition, a partnership with LA DOT and Trust South LA. Our program has been focused on community engagement around improving infrastructure on the smaller residential streets of the neighborhood network of the 2010 bike plan. All of our work has been in South Los Angeles. In seven months, we've touched over 400 kids and parents through outreach efforts with our largest successes happening with events based in schools. We've been welcomed onto campus by principals and parents who are hungry for better walking and biking conditions for their students and children. And the big takeaway for us is the recognition that schools are the centers of any community effort. Safe routes to school projects not only provide neighborhood mobility for our students during school hours, but provide better mobility for entire neighborhoods during non-school hours. And to that end, it's clear to us that Safe Routes infrastructure projects need to work for the neighborhood during non-school hours, which means outreach and buy-in from non-school stakeholders with respect to the changes in their community. 
Our current LA DOT staffing levels do not reflect a commitment to the type of engagement effort needed to provide community participation in the creation of vibrant neighborhood streets. By comparison, um, the plan for a healthy Los Angeles uh, over a year, they outreach to 100 people. Um, because we've had the resource through our funding through the Department of Public Health, we've been able to touch 400 in seven months. That's the level of engagement that we need. And, and unfortunately, DOT is um, not funded to do so. Um, my last piece. Uh, Community-based organizations, as I mentioned, are best positioned to assist with this, but we need the outreach sources directed to, to them to focus the tasks. I'm confident that with a robust Safe Routes program that builds synergies with efforts like implementation of the neighborhood network of the bike plan and provide for robust community engagement, we will have a vibrant network that keeps our youngest Angelinos safe all hours of the day. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Andres Ramirez. I'm here on behalf of Community Health Councils. We're a health policy organization working out of South LA. We're currently working on a project called Healthy Kids Zones. We're trying to create, um, center, making schools, 13 schools in South LA, the centers for physical activity and healthy living for communities around them. We're fully supportive of the Safe Routes School Strategic Plan. Our only recommendation is also more engagement with community, accessibility, um, and also making sure that er everything's accessible in multiple languages. That's what the one challenge we, we have noticed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And <clears throat> we have one final speaker, Antonio uh, Ramirez. Thank you. Well, common sense would dictate that all inner cities and Latino infested schools will never be safe because these children are byproducts of gangbangers. Therefore, these children are already indoctrinated into the Latino gang world of violence, mob lynchings, grand theft, vandalism, graffiti, gang stalking, criminal mayhem, piracy, computer and cell phone hacking, drugs, weapons, contrabands, and future homicidal maniacs. Thus, no amount of shock treatments will ever change that. These Latino children are automatic gangbangers by virtue of their parents and family members' affiliations, and that's a fact. Disastrously, these so-called children of gangbangers are tomorrow's domestic terrorists who will terrorize all law-abiding American citizens and hold them hostage because L.A. City wants them to be safe. What the city of L.A. is doing is enabling them and nurturing them to continue their wicked criminal empire at the cost of wonderful law-abiding American citizens whom the city of Los Angeles will not serve and protect but label them crazy. Um, a classic example is the East Los Angeles and 3rd and Lucas, the Pico Union area. Try living there. So stop protecting these wicked, treacherous, and evil deviants and their byproducts. Deport, deport, deport. Do your legally mandated jobs, and that is to make a safety zone to all law-abiding American children and their families and protect them from Latino gangbangers and their children who are the future terrorists. Again, uh, we have a criminal gangbanging empire. Let's protect the law-abiding citizens. And I speak from experience, not out of my gluteus maximus. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. You're uh, always welcome to exercise uh, your constitutionally mandated freedom of speech. I'm going to exercise mine for a second. I usually don't say anything in reaction to public comment. I just got to say, what, what you said was offensive, repulsive, and just outrageous and uh, I, 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 and, and, and racist and uh, I'm, I'm deeply offended. I usually don't comment from, from the podium on something like that, but if I were at a cocktail party, I'd have to say the same thing and, and I've got to say it now. And, and I'm sorry that members of this audience had to hear those comments. Uh, staff, um, please come up and bring some sunshine. <laughs> Uh. Council members, I'm Pauline Chen from LADOT from the Active Transportation Program. Um, Margot Cañas, our pedestrian coordinator, um, is here with me to present an interim report on the status of this pre preparation of a Safe Routes to School strategic plan. Let, let, let me just say before you begin how, how, how glad I am that we've gotten to this part. I know that 
uh, to this point. Councilmember Rosendahl uh, worked very hard for a number of years to, to try to get us to a place uh, where we have a strong and robust strategic plan. The council uh, has uh, allocated money over the past couple of years to have a strategic plan. And, um, uh, you know, maybe we've been waiting for Margot all these years. And uh, uh, I'm glad that that was a waiting for Godot pun, by the way, in case anybody missed it. I, I know, but I felt I was trying too hard. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I think we're now at a, at a different place. Uh, and I think that the time to be at this place has never been more important because uh, the, the, the money we get for safe routes to schools isn't free money. It isn't just given away because we ask for it. It's, it's a competitive process, and it's a more competitive process than it used to be because other cities have been ahead of us in data and metrics, and from what I'm understanding is we're now sort of competing in the same pot as not just the rest of Southern California, but Northern California, which, uh, you know, they've, they've uh, that, that, that's sort of daunting. So um, I'm glad to see us at this point. I uh, read the report and I was very encouraged by a number of things in it. If you could spend a few minutes uh, summarizing it for, for, for my colleagues and, and uh, tell us what the next steps are. Okay. Like Absolutely. I'll reintroduce myself. I am Margo Ocanias, pedestrian coordinator. I'd like to also call out that I have an incredibly qualified pedestrian coordinator partner in Valerie Watson, who's sitting behind me. So none of these efforts would be um, doable without our partnership. It's a privilege and honor to update you. Um, I would like to remind uh, the panel that I am the mother of two LAUSD students. I do, in fact, walk and bike with them several times a week to school, so I do try to walk the walk and talk the talk. Um, so I am both professionally and personally vested in the success of the Safe Routes to School program and its key principles, which are, one, to reduce significantly student age fatalities and severe injuries, as well as increase the share of students that are walking and biking. Today I'll share a, a succinct um, progress update on four strategic goals. Um, again, I must also highlight that our success to date has truly been um, rooted in an incredible collaboration with the city's pedestrian advisory committee and its stakeholders, LA Walks, the National Safe Routes to School Partnership, and LACBC. Um, and I will similarly detail our partnership with LAUSD. Goal number one, to develop a transparent data-driven plan, in essence, to support advanced planning. We have completed a prioritized list of the nearly 500 LAUSD schools within the city's jurisdiction. That prioritization methodology includes four indicators, pedestrian and bike collisions within a quarter mile of the schools, student density, again, data from LAUSD that's unprecedented in providing to the city, um, the free and reduced price meal, again, there seems to be a correlation in social equity. Lower income neighborhoods tend to be more dependent on um, active transportation. And lastly, whether the school has received safe routes to school funding. So those four indicators combined have helped us develop an algorithmic approach to ranking these schools by most need. I'd like to call out that over the past 12 months, this methodology has been vetted um, on an iterative basis with the PAC, Council Office staff, Department of Public Health, and LAUSD. This prioritization really provides a roadmap as we do advance planning and funding opportunities present themselves. Goal number two, build a partnership with LAUSD, city agencies, and stakeholders. We have significantly expanded our reach into LAUSD. When Valerie and I arrived on the scene, I believe there were two to three people in the city who were collaborating with LAUSD. In this past year, through Superintendent Dacey, he has specifically appointed key staff person in his office to be our Safe Routes to School point person. Uh, similarly, we've established an LAUSD Safe Routes to School Advisory Committee that now numbers 35, of which we meet on a, a quarterly basis. Through their group, we've also tapped through Walk to School Day 60 additional LAUSD individuals. And through the current ATP funding cycle, we've expanded that reach to 25. We now exceed an LAUSD engagement of over 100. Rather significant progress, I believe, in the past 12 months. We've also formalized um, communications through their own channels. We're leveraging LAUSD intranet, intranet, principal newsletters. Um, we've also established a walk to school website, um, which is the first part of developing a broader Safe Routes to School website, and we're doing this in collaboration with LAUSD. 
Likewise, we have um, worked closely with the chair of the Pedestrian Advisory Committee to expand attendance and really have undertaken a deliberate campaign to encourage more council office attendance so that we can have a forum for discussing safe routes to go school. I think our average attendance now actually exceeds 30. Lastly, we're also expanding our interaction with LAPD. This is the year of traffic. So we are looking and we're expanding our dialogue with our current PAC members from LAPD and exploring how we might collaborate on both education and enfor enforcement programs. There's a fantastic opportunity for LAPD and the Department of Transportation and our stakeholders to have a united voice and position on education. As has been called out by the previous um, members to this table, um, we really are now poised to expand our scope and our engagement with community-based organizations, with the advocacy group, with parents, with neighbors, and with community members. We've needed this past year to really build the foundations, collect the data, and we now would like to expand that visibility and engagement with those multiple stakeholders and diversify that voice at the table. Um, we've also called out, or as was called out before, there's some really fantastic programs such as Safe Passages. Those really provide toolkits that we should look to replicate. So as those um, challenged neighborhoods um, need solutions that we ha are preparing a toolkit in violence pr prevention. Safe Routes to School requires a holistic approach, engineering, education, encouragement, enforcement, and evaluation. Those are not traditionally the core capabilities of LADOT. I like to think that the professional background of myself and my partner Valerie Watson, in addition to the engineering expertise, are starting to round out that approach. And through the partnership, again, with the community members um, and so many of the wonderful CBOs, that we can, in fact, contain um, or continue that holistic approach. Goal number three, efficiency in plan and project development. Um, it's been valuable to merge bike and PEDS together. So as we're doing projects, we're actually working under a united active transportation approach. We've also bolstered our IT capabilities um, by retaining an IT architect. So again, to my earlier discussion about active transportation, we are aggressively um, mining the data. And again, for efficiency and, and program management, we need to continue to explore those mechanisms to partner and fund our community-based organizations. We are a bit strapped in that area, so we need, to con we need to continue to find that mechanism so that they can couple with us in moving forward. Goal number four, optimize funding opportunities. Um, in essence, all of the foundations that I've spoken to to date are really allowing us to be poised to tap the first wind, uh, funding uh, window, which is now available through the Active Transportation Program Grant. Cycle one's window opened last week. Um, applications are to be submitted in mid-May. We are, as Council Member Bonin called out, we are now in a competitive pool, but in that um, we are aggressively tapping this opportunity with submitting three applications. Uh, we are submitting for an engineering uh, grant, is, which is to do engineering improvements about a certain cluster of schools. We're also doing a standalone grant for education and enforcement. Again, we're exploring with LAUSD and LAPD of how to unify that approach to education and enforcement. Enforcement both being compliance to the engineering treatments, but also um, affecting the public safety side. The third application has to do with planning. As I mentioned, we have the prioritized list of schools. Our goal is through the planning application is to be able to develop school safety assessment studies around the top 50 schools, 41 in fact, because nine of those schools are being touched through the ATP process. Again, ATP is a very quantitative um, application and so we have distilled the criteria that I shared with you for the safe routes to school ranking with the ATP requirements resulting in uh, nine schools that we have targeted for ATP applications. Uh, we are leveraging the council approved bike plan and its bike friendly network overlaid with the locations of these schools so we are amplifying these non-arterial streets for the, um, both the walkability and the bikeability and the calmness that not only contributes to students safe walking and biking, but also for community members. Um, we are again thrilled to be a part of the larger family that's suggesting safe outs of school. Um, it is key to continue, um, or actually probably launch and expand our partnering with citizens and civic groups, creating that more sustainable and livable city. Um, and as part of our 
our goals for the city to make neighborhoods more livable and attractive. So thank you for your time, and I welcome questions. Thank you. Pauline, do you anything you want to add? Um, just to emphasize that um, the criteria on which we built this prioritization is very much in line with the historical and current and possibly future criteria that these grant opportunities um, present to us. So it's very important for staff to have this kind of a roadmap to delegate very limited resources in pre developing projects and uh, filling out applications, without which, as we had in the past, um, a lot of it was very random, and hence our success rate has been shown to be not desirable because of the randomness of, of those selections. Yeah, I've, I've noticed that, and that, that's very true. I'm, I'm curious, a, a, as we've developed a strategic plan, have we gone back and looked at not just our applications that did not succeed, but look at the actual successful applications to see what their, their strong points were uh, so we know how to replicate it? We have started an initial pass. One of the components of Safe Routes to School is we are looking to explore and expand what we'll call our pedestrian countermeasures toolbox, which is really that set of treatments that we can bring to plans. Um, we've started assessing some of the what I'll call gold sander Safe Routes to School um, grants, not necessarily in LA City, but across the state of what have been some of those award-winning grants and what are the types of treatments or recommendations. Yeah, those are the ones I want you to look at. Exactly. Yeah. So we're sort of taking it out of just looking at LA, but looking um, statewide at some of those highly successful grants. Yeah, please. Look at the ones that have been most successful, the, the communities that, that have, have led on getting the money. Uh, we can always do a better job at getting other people's money. Um, I wanted to ask a question to sort of follow up on the outreach uh, comments that we got. Uh, I, mean, I think everybody's very happy where we are, but wants to see a better job with outreach. You, you mentioned the, the partnership with LAUSD, and I'm, I'm, I'm curious who the partnership tends to be with at our local schools. Is it with uh, the principal or the assistant principal who is probably welcome to hear the information but is overburdened with 47 other things? Or are we also engaging with the the leadership of the Parent Teachers Association or the soccer coach or the, 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 the folks who volunteer part-time at the school? Um, it's been an interesting exploration into the large box of LAUSD. <laughs> um, it's a multi-tiered cake. Um, we have, through this process, um, been honored to engage with groups across operations to technology to data management to facilities. Um, with it, there are also layers of LAUSD that break them into educational service centers, east, west, north, and south. Um, within we, each of those regional groups, there is an operations person as well as a family community service branch individual who's really the point person on parent volunteer programs. So with particular funding opportunities like the one that we're in right now, we've had the opportunity to work directly with the principal, their administration, but in parallel, we've been continually communicating the schools that we're targeting and getting the referrals and support of the headquarters to put us in touch with those schools. So it really looks like a holistic, supported process by LAUSD as opposed to a just show up on the radar for this evaluation then to disappear. It, if, if you're not getting the, the, the sort of broader contacts through LAUSD, uh, some places that might be helpful might even be the council offices. I mean, I know that, that my field reps and, and our neighborhood councils work closely with a lot of schools mm -hmm. uh, that can sort of give you a broader portrait of who the stakeholders are than you might get just going through the LAUSD um, portal. Uh, might also be, be, be good now that you've come to this committee to um, uh, brief Councilwoman Martinez, uh, who obviously knows LAUSD well and might have some suggestions on how to uh, better infiltrate. She's also a very strong supporter of uh, active transportation and safe routes to schools. In fact, her name was just messaged yesterday with the, um, the superintendent's point person, Lydia, had called out that she had worked closely with Nuri and their involvement to date. So I, I again encourage and really appreciate the support of the people who have come to the table before. I think we've, um, we're really poised at this time to work our tentacles into being transparent and more inclusive. Thank you for this work. It's about time we got into the business of strategic planning around Safe Routes to School. Uh, I'm very pleased by this. This is one of my 
most important priorities is safety around our schools and pedestrian uh, safety, ch safety of our children. It's one of the uh, public speakers mentioned also, not just on tra the transportation front, but also with regard to violence as, as well. Um, and I appreciate that you're trying to take a data-driven approach to this. I look at this, though, and I've got a question whether there is some flaw someplace in this uh, data framework when 40% of the population of this city that resides in the San Fernando Valley is entirely excluded from this. We have two San Fernando Valley schools in the list of the top 50. There are seven council members who represent the San Fernando Valley. Five of those districts have no schools in this top 50 list, and two of them have one each. I just got to believe that there's something unnecessarily skewing this data away from, uh, from the valley, which I'm having a great deal of trouble understanding. How it is that 50 of the top 50 schools, of the top 40 schools, there's not a single one in the San Fernando Valley representing 40% of the population of the city. It's kind of unfathomable to me. Fair enough. I will, uh, in response to that question, when we speak to the prioritization methodology um, and in coupled with wanting to be more efficient in the funding, one of the indicators is, in fact, that student density within one quarter mile radius of the school. So in other words, we looked at the indicator of collisions and we looked at the indicator of student density. In fact, they were equally weighted within this calculation. The understanding is that we wanted to be able to target funding initially towards those schools that do in fact high, have the highest number of children and collisions so that those funding dollars that we do secure have the highest per capita impact. Um, understandably, the methodology we really borrowed from best practices um, to blend into our methodology is, is distinct. I think there's an opportunity over time to explore the weight difference between those indicators. Starting from ground zero, we did need to actually start with a quantitative tool. But I think your comment is well taken. We will continue to um, work with the council offices. We'll use the PAC and others as forms to debate and dialogue on the indicator. Um, but again, we've, we've been since September of last year providing that inf information to staff and have welcomed their feedback. Okay. And, and if I can just, I, I get that you want to get the most bang for your buck um, find, and to some extent density is an appropriate factor to, to evaluate that. Another way to look at that might be, though, that with a quarter mile radius around the school, um, you're, you're going to automatically have more schools in the more population dense areas of the city. But on the other hand, um, that also means that the students in the less dense areas are having to go farther to get to school and have a greater risk factor because they are walking or biking farther to school. So, um, and that's not reflected in this data at all. In fact, that factor is excluded from the data. So, um, I, I, we don't need to resolve this now. I'll be happy to work, you know, with you. But I got to tell you, I'm, I look at this list and I'm gravely concerned about, you know, th that we're missing something if, if this is the way the results come out. I mean, you're, we're basically excluding half of the city of Los Angeles. The other part that and, I'd and like... And by the way, this, you know, I, I, I don't want this to, um, you know, be misinterpreted because some of the area, in terms of FREs and other things, some areas of the valley have, you know, some of the highest percentages of poverty and need anywhere in the city as well. So, and, and yet they're not represented here. So um, that's, that's my concern. I, um, to respond to that, I think another aspect of the criteria prioritization is that we're, we're, it's very obvious that the whole city has substantial need. Um, we are um, one of the focus cities um, for the FHWA pedestrian safety program because amongst 
many of the major cities in the United States, we have a very high um, pedestrian crash uh, frequency compared to other um, compared to the national average. And so, throughout the city, we do have, in a sense, an epidemic of pedestrian crashes. I think, um, however, in the denser populated areas, we also get the denser um, uh, number of um, pedestrian bicycle crashes. So it's not that there is less, there is no need in other parts of the city, it's just that the urgency, um, the crisis is occurring in these parts of the city where you have a population that is much more highly dependent on walking, biking, and transit. So it's just like the old photo red light debate. Um, do we serve the intersections where the crashes are already happening and deal with those um, needs there first? And then, um, then we can do more preventative measures elsewhere. I think that this is our first pass as our, at our top schools, but this list will evolve um, as we refresh the data, the crash data, the population density data, and so forth. So this is not a static list. We're just working on the first 50. And as we become more informed about the criteria that we should be using based on city priorities, based on new funding priorities, this list will evolve. Um, but I think it should remain transparent, data-driven, and that we're all on the same page about what is informing our policy and priorities. As a follow-up, I will also say that through this process, um, and even now where we're going through the funding process, it's really forcing us to formulize um, processes in reporting. So for example, when we're doing what we call school safety assessment studies, we're developing templates on how to more expediently assess the situation. We're developing toolkits of what are the menu of options from an education perspective, from an engineering perspective. So as we evolve these toolkits, which is really happening somewhat at an accelerated um, pace right now, as was mentioned before, we have a great opportunity to engage those community-based organizations, those community groups, those parents that are really involved with the schools and want to make an effort there that we're actually also providing these toolkits so that that information can be gathered more quickly and expediently so that when funding windows make themselves available, we have those school safety assessment um, studies in place. And, I'll put in my brash plug that addition of resources would be significant so that when these funding opportunities present themselves, we can move through that list more aggressively and tap the school safety assessments that have already been completed. Yeah, one question, uh, and it may be a somewhat ignorant one, uh, partly because of my district and lack of focus on it, but. Uh, I had always assumed the safe routes to school also included considerations beyond traffic and number of accidents and got into uh, uh, issues like a uh, you know, level of, of physical violence and gang activity. And I don't have much of that in my district, so I never really asked about it. But is that not part of this program? And Absolutely. Is there a reason why you're not reporting on those factors? Is it just that this is a transportation committee, or is there something I'm missing? Fair enough. Within Safe Routes to School, there are the five E's, engineering, education, encouragement, and enforcement, and evaluation. Under the umbrella of enforcement, you have both the enforcement and compliance to the engineering countermeasures, but you also have both the enfor enforcement to address the public safety concerns. Um, safe passages, which was mentioned earlier, is really um, groundbreaking in its approach to weaving very tightly the police, communities, parents, CBOs in, a, in a, an approach to addressing this, the public safety concerns for children moving to school. That's an example of something that needs to be, quote, toolkitted so that it can be easily replicated and move, it, move to other parts of the city. That requires an, exp, uh, an exploring of the relationship with LAPD as well. So again, in the spirit of their recently adopting the year of traffic and their focus on pedestrian bikes, I think that that window is presenting itself. So I, we have... But is that a factor in, in how you picked your... For the prioritization? Because it's not mentioned in... in it is not, it is not an read. indicator at this time, so I think there's an opportunity to explore um, evolving the methodology to perhaps include that. 
seems like if that's part of, of what we're dealing with, it, it really should be part of the methodology. Obviously, it doesn't, I don't think that helps me. It makes it even less likely that we're, we're covered. But I think it's, it's probably an important thing to weave in if we're, if we're really going to make this work. And we're, over this past year, has been, um, inc we're increasingly aware of the types of data that are available um, comprehensively across the city so that we could actually knit that into um, uh, an indicator calculation. Well, I think we should. Needless to say, I think we should. I, I thought I heard Mr. Koretz's question differently. Maybe, maybe I heard it wrong. I, I, I thought he was asking, he was talking about public safety, uh, not just public safety of uh, traffic or risk of auto accidents or, or, or speeders and stuff like that, but also public safety of the risk in, in, in many communities of a, of a drive-by shooting. Correct. Uh, or gang violence. Correct. Um, and uh, so I guess the, the question is, are, are you saying that that is currently weighted in this or that is uh, no. insufficiently weighted? It is not weighted. It is not included in the prioritization calculation at this time. Within the Safe Routes to School strategic plan, there's an emphasis on the five E's of which enforcement is one of them, and under the umbrella of enforcement is that attention to the public safety component. Again, not traditionally a core capability mm -hmm. of LADOT, but again, recognizing the work that's being done in safe passages. Um, we need to explore the mechanism for working with them or funding those types of, um, the, those types of packages or programs to be implemented in other parts of the city. So I, I think what I'd like to recommend is that we uh, receive and file this report, but that we have another report in committee maybe in 60 days or so uh, on the, the, the specific criteria just so we get a little bit of a better handle on it. Uh, I, I think to me the most important criteria at the end of the day is uh, wh which measures will will predictably save the most lives, and uh, you know, on the current list, you know, my district doesn't rank particularly well either. But if it'll save more lives in 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 CD8 or in CD2 or CD15, if the money spent there, then I'm 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 fine with that. This is kind of a triage because uh, the the stats I saw is. Uh, school age kids ages 5 to 17 account for 19% of all pedestrian related collisions and 18% of all fatally or severely injured pedestrians. So I'm sure there's a problem everywhere if I think we just need to get a better sense on you know does having taller denser communities give more weight are we are we sufficiently weighting the the risk of a of a drive by shooting to someone who walks to work? Uh, are we sufficiently weighting uh, you know the the, the, the speed of uh, of vehicles or or you know texting related traffic accidents in a neighborhood and stuff like that? So just so we get a, of transit. Yep, availability of transit. Just so we get a little bit of a better handle on that. So we'll receive and file this and then uh, ask for a report back on some additional info so we can drill down a little bit on the criteria. Uh, I want to thank uh, Mr. Krikorian and Mr. Koretz for bearing with me for a long meeting. I want to thank Mr. Kr Mr. Uh, Muckry for being here, our general manager from DOT. And uh, uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. This meeting was fun. <laughs>